Hi there, you're listening to The Steve Schramm Show, where we train Christians to become confident, passionate servants of Jesus so they can grow in their walk with God and share their faith more persuasively. Welcome to the show. All right, I am so excited about this week's episode. This is the very first episode in a special edition of the podcast that we're going to be doing called Creation Conversations. Now, we're going to have these throughout the year. We may do them um, one per month. I don't know. Uh, more often than that, I'm not sure. It depends on the reception. But this is a special edition of the Steve Schramm Show called Creation Conversations. And in this Uh, edition, what we're going to be doing is talking with people who both agree with my views on creation and disagree with my views on creation uh, to kind of bridge the gap, really, and to to create some great discussion around this um, question, around the idea of the biblical creation narrative. And uh, so there are definitely going to be some Um, views here that you agree with, some views here that you disagree with. I would encourage you to have an open mind about it, though. And I really think that you are going to be blessed by very much of what you hear. My first guest, uh, we had a extended discussion. It was uh, a couple hours long. And I thought about what to do. I thought about, uh, do I split this up into multiple episodes? Do I go ahead and just uh, play the whole thing together? And after really thinking about it, um, what I have decided to do is leave this discussion intact and let you guys really just take the whole thing in. I realize it might take some time. It'll probably take a couple different listening sessions to get through it. But I thought it was so valuable and so worth your time that I just had to leave it together. What we really do is get to the core heart of the issue. We discuss issues of why creation matters. Why do we talk about this stuff? What are the real issues when we're talking about it? What are the best arguments to use? What are some bad arguments to use? Um, I would encourage anybody who does not agree with the young age creationist position that many of you know that I hold, I would encourage you to listen to this interview. If you do nothing else, listen to this interview so you get a taste of, you get a glimpse of why we think that this issue matters so much and uh, and, and really what we think that the best uh, the best way of thinking about this issue is. So this interview I, I conducted with Dr. Stephen Lloyd. Now, uh, Dr. Lloyd is a uh, kind of a researcher and a fellow of what is known as the um, Biblical Creation Trust. He is actually both a researcher and a uh, lecturer there, and is also the pastor of Hope Church in Gravesend. Now, he studied material science at the University of Cambridge, became a Royal Society University Research Fellow. He's also got a diploma in theology and religious studies from the University of Cambridge. He contributed to the book Debating Darwin, published by Peter Noster, hope I'm saying that right, in 2009. And I have also heard Dr. Lloyd on different debates. Uh, he's done quite a few debates on Justin Brierley's show, Unbelievable. He's debated Ken Samples, Dr. Hugh Ross, uh, John Walton. So he, certainly he is a very seasoned researcher and thinker, and it is our privilege and honor to discuss this topic with him today. We centered around a paper that he wrote called Chronological Creationism, and I'm just going to let him take it from there. There are some links and things that we are going to place in the notes for you so that you can have things for your reference to follow along with. Mostly, I would encourage you to go download this actual paper so that you can get his thoughts most fully fleshed out. So without any further ado, let's get to my interview with Dr. Stephen Lloyd. All right, Dr. Stephen Lloyd, we are privileged to have you here with us. Thank you for uh, for being on the show today. Thank you. It's good to be with you. All right. Um, I, I kind of gave you a little bit of an introduction there uh, before we got started, but is, is there anything that you'd like to, to add with respect to like your current, le- your, your current ministry work? What kind of things are you doing today? Do you have a current research focus? Uh, I think everybody would probably love to know that. Yeah, well, of course, my main job is actually as a pastor of a church. I'm the pastor of a, of a small church, and that obviously uh, takes up a lot of my uh, time and energy. 
and it, it means I'm I'm seeing how creation stuff is actually relevant in just normal church ministry. I mean, I think on on the sort of creation work I've been doing, the, one of the things I've been focusing on uh, in the last few months has been thinking about the goodness of creation, how we relate, you know, creation to new creation, uh, how we understand, you know, creation in terms of some of the environmental debate today, and it was. Well, it sort of came together in a talk I was doing. It was actually for Answers in Genesis at their mega conference in the UK uh, in October. And uh, if people are interested in in that whole that whole area, um, you can actually listen to that. It's, it's not a great recording, but you can listen to that uh, on from our website. So, so yeah, that's that's you know, I I mean the the other sort of work we do with Biblical Creation Trust, we're very much focused on trying to reach pastors and and students um we want to reach leaders because you know it's it's no good just uh, getting a congregation to to be on side if the leadership is not you haven't really changed anything and and it's and that and that means our focus our strategy is perhaps a little bit different to some other creation groups we are a little bit more low-key a little bit more undercover uh trying really to 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 influence the influencers that that's very much part of our our, our ethos oh yeah i love that that i think that makes a, a lot of sense because you know the old saying is if you aim for everybody you, you a lot of times you hit nobody <laughs> so yeah um that, that's that's really good because those are the ones that are um uh, you know that affect change and uh, what i have noticed and this is kind of a sad observation is that a, a lot of the uh leadership they they look to uh, they they look to resources that are only uh, those that are developed uh, for popular audiences and a lot of times the leadership doesn't really understand this is just my personal experience in, in talking with some of the leadership uh, they don't really understand the arguments they don't really understand the importance of of taking a a particular view of of creation that kind of preserves some of the theological significance and things like that so so that's good i think y'all are doing excellent work over there so uh the main thing that you know we are discussing today is of course this paper you wrote entitled chronological creationism and we are definitely going to provide a link for everybody listening so that they can go read this paper for themselves and uh, i personally as i read through it and i've read through it a couple times now i personally believe it's probably one of the most um just sound treatments of this of this subject that I've read and uh, that has a, a lot to do with your with your tone with your general approach um, most people who read this paper I think will come away not realizing that there are creationists who um, who take this kind of approach to things and who are, are willing to stand up for truth but still be amicable with those who disagree and really try to persuade those who disagree with with good arguments rather than kind of the old same uh, tired stuff. Uh, and so I, I really appreciate that. And I think others who read will appreciate that as well. So before we dive too far into oh, it, just, yeah, go ahead. Very, very, thank you for your, for your kind words. It probably wouldn't get an award for the catchiest title. Um, <laughs> but there was a sort of reason for the title in the context, but we've actually republished it as an organization as, as a sort of hard copy with a, di with a different title, Adam or death, which came first. So if that uh, sounds more appealing to people, um, that's that's another way we've republished it. Wonderful, wonderful. That's 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 awesome, and uh, I I think that is a really sound way of putting it too. Uh, because uh, well, we'll get into that we'll, as we talk as we talk through. We'll we'll, we'll look at why that matters, and and um, definitely if there's something new we can learn from your paper. So why not go ahead and spend just a few minutes discussing kind of the main idea behind the paper, kind of summarize it, and uh, and then kind of speak to why you felt that this paper needed to be written? Well, the, maybe I'll answer the second bit first. I mean, okay. I was actually asked to write this paper um, uh, in, the, in the journal this was published in, it's, it's Foundations, it's a, a sort of theological journal for the sort of conservative evangelical churches in, in Britain. There was a paper that had come out um, really arguing for a sort of old earth position and really arguing not, not so much for that as, well, let's just not worry about it too much. and to cut a long story short, I was asked to not so much write a rebuttal as, a, as an alternative position, which is which is what I did. So that's how I ended up uh, writing that piece. And I think 
to me, it was a great opportunity because part of what we're trying to do is to change the face of the creation debate. Uh, it is a very tired debate. And it's because I think very often we're not asking the right questions. Uh, you know, we're going to get on to the days and, and people saying, well, how long were the days? As if that is the biggest issue. Um, I don't think it is, as we'll, as we'll get to. And I think as well, it's so important that we don't simply shout louder as our sort of response to one another. Because the whole debate has become polarised. It's probably even more polarised in America, actually, than, than here in Britain. So I think what I was, was trying to do was to come up with a methodology, if you like, for a creationist position. To have, to have a sort of method behind your work is, is a central part of academia. I used to be a microscopist and there were loads of people that would produce images from, from electron microscopes at conferences um, claiming all sorts of things that were not always accurate because they didn't understand how these images were produced, the problems with them, the artifacts, the sort of methodology, if you like, of, of, of using uh, this tool in the best way. Same in biblical studies, lots of things. So you, you haven't just got an arbitrary approach that you're just quoting what happens to fit your argument and ignoring everything else. So I'm trying to here develop a, a methodology, if you like, to address the creation issue that is actually coming from the Bible. And I guess I'll, I'll explain what that is in a moment. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm, so I'm, trying to, I'm trying to give a methodology. And I think the other thing I'm trying to do is to show that this is all very mainstream. People think of creationism as a sort of recent invention or something a bit sort of wacky on the side of the church. I would argue what I'm talking about here is just very normal mainstream Christianity down the ages. I mean, that that talk I mentioned um, that I've been preparing on the goodness of creation, I, I essentially was basing the whole thing on John 1, 14. Uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, which everyone would agree is a pretty central part of Christian theology. And I was really saying, well, look, if you believe that, young earth creationism actually flows directly from that central tenet of Christianity. Hmm. And if you can't work out how that can be, you'll have to listen to the talk and see whether you agree or not. <laughs> so methodology and, and mainstream. I like that. That um, that makes sense to me because as I was reading the paper and also um, I've observed this myself, a lot of people I traffic in, you know, these theological and apologetics circles, and there are a surprising number of people who make statements in defense of things like God and evil and suffering and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. They make statements in defense of the goodness of, of God and the badness uh, of suffering yeah. and, and evil. And yet uh, a lot of times uh, their statements kind of a younger age creationist position would actually follow from their understanding of those statements. But yet in their public uh, persona, they do not, they do not affirm uh, young age creationism. So there's almost like a contradictory uh, thing going on there. Yeah, that was very much what I was addressing in the apologetic section of, of, of this paper, where I'm trying to sort of argue for a more holistic approach, where we see how different apologetic issues are interconnected and what, what you can argue on creation actually affects how you deal with things like the problem of suffering. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I think that's great. We're about to dive into it. I, you know, I think that's great because a lot of times, even in some of the more popular creationist uh, organizations and circles, you hear that these things are interconnected, but they're always just kind of assertions. They're never thought through, as you said, methodologically. And so it, it ends up just being shouting louder and louder and louder at each other because the creationist is like, can't you see? Can't you see this connection? And um, those who would not affirm this position are like, no, I, I don't see it. These things seem unrelated. And so what I love about this paper is you tie you tie the knot together. You, you really show um, graciously, I think, but, but firmly. You show how these things are interconnected and why they matter so much. So um, that's what we're going to dive into uh, right now. Um, so let's start out with the first kind of section that you write about. You title it The Age of the Earth and Chronology, and you, uh, you subtitle that with Methodological Considerations. And again, I am just going by, since I don't have the clever, uh, the clever new way that you have reworked this uh, with the... Um, 
which came first, Adam or death, or Adam, 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 Adam and death, which came first. However, you said you worded that. Uh, I'm working with the chronological creationism paper, so forgive me if my headings and such. <laughs> headings are all the same. Don't okay. worry. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Um, so uh, the first thing that we need to address is the age of the earth and chronology. And I, I just made some notes as I was going through. You know, you make mention that too much seems to be made of arguments surrounding the days in Genesis 1, for example. Um, as a matter of fact, you make the statement that um, the common creationist focus on 24-hour days as a shibboleth of orthodoxy rather misses the point. Uh, I love that. Explain why you think that's the case. Yeah, I, I put it like that partly to stir things up a bit. Um, <laughs> and I mean, I think that, I mean, just to be very clear, I do believe the days in Genesis 1 are normal days. And I think there's lots of very good biblical reasons for saying that. I'm just saying that my my creationist position doesn't actually depend upon that. And I think the problem with focusing on this issue of the days and going to great length to try and sort of talk about all of that is that I think those that perhaps take a different view sort of think, well, what? why is this important? You know, we're arguing about one word in one chapter. Yeah, OK, every part of the Bible is important. Every word's important. But in the big scheme of Christian theology, does this really matter? And I think if we then say, yes, it's all about the days, they think, well, no, obviously it doesn't matter because it's, it's actually about something fairly minor. So it, it, I think, puts the focus in the wrong direction. It immediately gives the impression, actually, this is an issue that doesn't matter very much, that's actually a bit fringe. It's not really anything to do with central theology. Yeah, but, but yeah, the yeah. other, Sorry, the, the other point is that actually it doesn't, a young earth position does not actually depend on the length of the days. We're, assume, we, we, so we're so used to putting the two together, we don't see that logically they are not necessarily connected. For example, you could have a position where you said there was creation in six, you know, normal 24 hour days, if you like, 4.5 billion years ago. It, 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 simply saying how long the days are doesn't tell you when those days occurred. And obviously that is not a position that's going to commend itself um, to anyone. I mean, an evolutionist would say, well, that's crazy because human beings haven't been around for 4.5 billion years. Um, you know, a creationist would also have a, have a problem with that, too. So it's not as simple as simply how long are the days? What's really what's really going on, I think, in this debate is is we're thinking about a sequence of events. We're talking about what happened when. And that is a chronology. And that is why I focused on this, uh, th th this, this term sort of chronological that's what's really crucial. It's not a particular figure for age, even. It's about the order of events. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, l I love that. You know, one of the uh, when you were saying that, I was thinking about how how many books have been written that are literally I mean, they're in the title. I mean, they're, that are devoted to the issue of the days. Um, you know, I mean, there are books that are in support of that position uh, of the six day position that have been written that have to do with the days there are books by very influential dissenters uh, from that view who uh, have written books that are all about the days and I kind of find myself pulling my hair out over <laughs> that because to me it's clear that that's not the issue we actually have two podcast episodes uh, I don't I forget the numbers I will link to those in the in the notes for anyone who okay. wants to go back to them we have two podcast episodes that are almost entirely dedicated to that point to, to the point that the, the, the days uh, that that misses the point that's not really where the argument is so I was happy to see you point this out um, and now you started talking about chronology and that's really uh, I think where you're going to show that the that the issue lies. You brought out a quote by the late Old Testament scholar James Barr, and according to him, chronology apparently was so important to the biblical record that such details are, quote, a major reason why the divine origin and authority of Scripture should be accepted at all, close quote. Now, that, now that's a pretty bold claim. Do you care to elaborate on that? Yeah, I think it, perhaps you, that could be slightly misunderstood. It's, that isn't what James Barr thinks. What he's doing is explaining why many great Christian thinkers of the past uh, laid such a stress on the chronology of the Bible. And I think, you see, today it's not it's, it's a sort of issue that as Christians, we tend to just sort of think is 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 irrelevant or even a bit cranky. You know, James Usher and the whole 
uh, dating scheme he's come up with is almost sort of associated with being a complete idiot. But but actually, James Usher was an incredible academic and, and very much and, and James Barr is, is very much respecting him in terms of his, his academic work. He obviously disagrees with him because he has a different view of scripture. But in terms of his his approach, his 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 methodology, if you like, um, he, he would admire Usher. And and it wasn't just people like Usher. There was lots of other different intellectuals, even someone like Isaac Newton, um, who people presumably would not dismiss as an idiot, did a lot of stuff on on chronology and and. You may disagree with some of that, but uh, Martin Luther as well wrote a book on chronology. This was a very much a mainstream concern of the church. And, and in that that quote, what Barr was really saying is that that, that people argued, well, look, it's, it's incredible when you compare the Bible to other sources that the Bible contains so much historical information and so much sort of dated historical information. It's, it's giving us numbers and timescales going back to the beginning. There is nothing else like that in in the sort of literature of the time. How could they have have known all these things? This in itself is evidence for the divine origin of scripture, that it contains this sort of information at this level of detail. That that is how people like Luther and others at the time would have argued. Oh, that's pretty significant, for sure. Um, And that's the irony is that in today, that has kind of been lost. Uh, if anything, popular kind of apologetics today really downplays the issue of chronology. And that's that's surprising to me. Um, to me, even, uh, and, and you didn't really discuss this in the paper, but to me, even uh, prophecy and things like that depend very much so on uh, chronological information and things happening at a particular time and in a particular order and as much yep. emphasis as the bible places on that i'm surprised uh, that there's not more emphasis in modern apologetics on that i mean i think christians run scared of it precisely because of the origins issue i mean mm. when i'm speaking to you from here in my in my study i've actually got a timeline a sort of children's timeline from a, a very good evangelical publisher uh, and, you know, it's got, you know, different people in the Old Testament. It's got David, you know, around 1000 BC, Abraham around 2000 BC. And then it's got a dotted line before that where it, with just this sort of uh, thing underneath that says earliest times. <laughs> um, as if, you know, oh, the wow. publishers that be very much into, you know, the inerrancy of scripture and everything, but running scared on starting to put numbers on anything um, going mm. back to that creation, creation time. That's and I think extremely that's, that's unfortunate. Mistake. Yeah, yeah, that, I agree. That's extremely unfortunate. Um, so let's dive into that then. So you, you talk about in your paper a, a about two different concepts when it comes to chronology. One is absolute chronology and the other is relative chronology. Well, I think we're all probably smart enough to understand the difference between those two words. Uh, but can you kind of flesh out uh, what you mean by each of them kind of in our context? Um, you know, what's the significance of absolute chronology and relative chronology with respect to the paper at large right well by absolute chronology we mean the bible gives gives numbers um and and actually gives the right numbers to enable you to to construct a chronology that goes all the way back to to the beginning so that you can get numbers for the date of the flood um the date of adam or whatever and, and it's very interesting that, that, that there's sort of incidental information provided that without which you could not do that. Um, you know, we're told our facts was born two years after the flood, Genesis 11, 10. You sort of think, well, why are we being told that? Well, actually, without that, you couldn't do the chronology. Um, there's, there's other examples of that as if the Bible's wanting us to do this. So. And, and we need to be careful. It's, it's not a totally precise chronology. There are there are question marks, partly textual, um, over how we we understand certain numbers. Which time period is it talking about? You know, that there's various textual uncertainties. There's also problems of you know when you talk about things happening, um, you know, in, cer- in certain years. Well, did every? Or, 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 sorry, thinking more of the genealogies in, in in Genesis. You know, did they all have the same birthday? Well, presumably not. So. In, in so-and-so's, you know, 130th year, accounting for those different birthdays and things means you're never going to have total precision. Not, and there's lots of other factors that mean you don't, but that doesn't mean the numbers can mean anything at all. 
So, you, so you've got those those absolute figures. But I think that the sort of methodology I was trying to set out was using the example of there's something in the New Testament where uh, Paul argues in, in the book of Romans and the book of Galatians um, about the priority of, of, uh, of, of, if you like, faith over law. Now, we immediately start getting into a big theological issue there. <laughs> I'm not concerned about that theological issue. I'm simply concerned about the way um, Paul argues because he argues from history. He he says um, that faith has priority because of the chronological priority of Abraham over Moses. Abraham came first. So that's a relative chronology. If you like, his argument rests on Abraham having existed before Moses. If If it was the other way around, his argument wouldn't work. It doesn't matter how far apart they are for that argument. You know, they could have been 40 years later. It could have been 4000 years later. Um, it's it's uh, but it's it's the issue of who comes first. And he's saying Abraham comes first. But he also gives a number and he quotes this number of 400 and what well, well, he quotes the number of 430 years. That's not necessarily the time from Abraham to to uh, to Moses. It's, it gets very complicated quite what does that number refer to but what's interesting is that he gives a specific number uh, there's a great paper by Harold Honer that, that talks about where that number comes from and that's referenced in the paper but he so he's yes I'm saying he the, the argument the theological argument rests on the relative chronology but he's also giving you a bit of absolute chronology too Right. And so we don't want to I think that I think that many people who disagree with the young age position would at least want to say for the most part that they affirm this relative the the importance of the relative chronology. It's perhaps that um perhaps the absolute chronology they think uh, sure. there's some flexibility. You know, and I, I was thinking as you were talking about that I, I'm really uh, glad to see that you 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 made a little bit of nuance in the with the numbers and the genealogies and things in the beginning um, portions of the Bible because I, there people need to realize that there are people in Old Testament scholarship who make some pretty compelling arguments that these numbers are not to be taken with a sort of, in some cases, the numbers um, yeah. are not to be taken with a sort of kind of wooden literalism, so to speak. It's not as though if it says 130 years, that that means exactly 130 years. There was there was rounding and things going on that would yeah. have been common to that culture. Um, but at the same time, a lot of people, and this is really surprising to me because I don't think they would let anybody else get away with this, but a lot of people who hold that view then take that to, to mean that these numbers can just kind of mean anything. You'll often hear a comparison between the numbers presented in the Bible and like um, numbers that are present in other ancient Near Eastern like king lists and things like that where the numbers are like, you know, 32,000 years or something completely blown out and they'll use kind of they'll use that to say that in the Bible the absolutist um, you know, the ab absolutism or however you want to put that, the absolute nature of the numbers is not quite there but i don't think that means we can just say that they mean anything they they do have a, a particular meaning that yeah. doesn't go far beyond what the text says i would say definitely the fact that they're not totally precise doesn't mean they can mean anything at all and i think we are given lots of clues that we are meant to take these as real historical um you know numbers I mean, when people talk about the sort of long ages in, in the early chapters of Genesis sort of being symbolic, the problem is no one has ever managed to come up with what, what the symbolism is. Right. Uh, and you just thought, well, if it's symbolic, it's going to be to have any purpose in this literature. It's got to be obvious to a reader or possible to a reader to work out what that symbolism <laughs> is. So and but what we are told, though, you know, is is events in people's lives. You know, Noah has his children when he's 500. He builds it or he goes into the ark when he's uh, 600. Um, so different parts of their life are sort of itemized and and as well the problem doesn't simply if you see the long ages as a problem it it, it doesn't end with Genesis 1 to 11 you know what you do with Abraham 
right what do you, what do you do and and i actually think taking the numbers seriously actually helps to explain things about the text um i, I there's some sermons on the early chapters of Genesis that uh, you can find on our, on our website, and uh, I go into this. I think in the last the last one of those, you know, Abraham's life. Um, you know, why was Sarah seen as a seductively beautiful woman when she was so old? Well, was it because actually mm. she was that age, but the way people aged at that time was slower? It explains things about Ishmael, um, how he could be portrayed as this vulnerable child when he's aged 13 or 14, I think it is, in in those chapters in Genesis. So there's there's all sorts of things about the text that sort of actually make more sense when you take uh, these numbers seriously and take them as uh, as the way ageing has perhaps changed over time. And it it extends even, it's not just sort of the big figures in the Bible, even people like um, Moses' father, um, is it Amram? Um, I'm, I'm... going from memory here you know, i think it's 100, 137 you know the time of moses well you know that that's that's quite a long age you know so right so i think actually what the bible says about these ages does actually make a lot of sense as seeing them as as the internal evidence i think points to these being real real ages yeah, great. And not only that, but I, I think, uh, and there are like counter arguments, and I'm not here to like press you on those. I know, like, for example, I've heard one person argue, well, why is it that Sarah, um, like, laughed about being able to have a child because of her old age yeah. if 99 yeah. was actually young? You know, like, so there's, like, as you said, unless you want to, you're welcome to elaborate on that, but, but the point I want to make is that there are question marks and there are things that, um, they kind of go either way. As a matter of fact, what 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 I think that if, if we're going to make kind of a a, um, a conservative claim, what I think they demonstrate is that there is some flexibility to how literally you take them, but there is some constraints also on how literally you take them. That they can't go beyond just w- whatever you want them to be, kind of thing. So that's good. Definitely, and I think, and perhaps to, to get it back to the to the issue for us tonight is um or at least tonight in in britain where i'm speaking to you um the uh we'll be thinking about the genealogies and, you know, and, and gaps in genealogies people often say oh but genealogies can have gaps which of course they can um you know we, it, it, and we and we actually know that because we have complete genealogies so we can see that there are some of them that are presented as as, as gaps for example in, in matthew's gospel or whatever uh but that but the um but the way that the, the numbering is done in Genesis, where you're given people's age when they beget children and whatever, it, it, it's quite hard to see how you can have gaps within that sort of a scheme. And also, it's very clear in the text that there are very, you can't just say, oh, father means ancestor of, you know, Adam was very clearly the literal father of Seth. You know, Terah was the literal father of Abraham. So, it seems, so why assume that, that that is not the case for the other people mentioned? And even if you want to say, you know, th- th- there are still some problems with, with you know, there's, there's lots of complexities in these genealogies. But ev- even even if you say, well, OK, we, we can have some gaps. How much time I, is that going to give you, um, you know, to have uh, thousands and thousands of years added and it's actually hundreds of thousands of years you need added the number of gaps is is astonishing and it's actually i think becomes unworkable and just bizarre right so it's it's not some sort of um magic wand to solve all problems of chronology it, they the, you know the the difficulties with genealogies means that, that that we we can't be totally precise but again the numbers can't mean anything at all. Uh, can't just 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 mean anything. Right, right. That's perfect. I think that's a great way of a great way of putting it. And so this really is um, more of where the hammer falls. I mean, this is this what we're getting at right now is much more significant of an issue than the length of the days, for example. This really touches on it. And now this is also where our view would depart quite heavily um, from those who would want to affirm that that there are longer ages in view. But this is an awkward portion of Scripture for people who who don't accept a young age timescale, and I don't think I'm saying anything controversial there. I think that there there is lots of 
of nuance that would need to be worked out for the person who denies kind of a young age view of scripture. And they've, some of them have attempted to, to work some of those things out. Uh, so given, given that, how do we interpret, this is kind of how you close out this section, how do we uh, interpret and kind of incorporate the extra biblical chronological information that we have to deal with from like modern dating methods and you like, because people who, who disagree with the young age position, now that, let me just be clear, because I have listeners of all varieties, there are yep. certainly those who disagree with the young age position who don't even take a position. So I'm not talking about them necessarily right now, even though I think that that's wrong-headed. What I'm talking about is, is those there are those who take an old age position because they are convinced of its truthfulness from the old uh, from chronologies and dating methods that lie outside of, of the Bible, and so they try to kind of maneuver that. So how do we interpret that information? Yeah, I mean, obviously the Bible doesn't have um, B.C. and A.D. dates. It would be quite handy if it did, wouldn't it? But, uh, <laughs> sure but for would. obvious reasons, it doesn't. So it's, it's, an, it's an internal chronology. It's its own chronology. Mm-hmm. It's based on, you know, time between different events that it talks about you know different kings reigns or whatever so you've you've got to to so i think you know what what we do is again this is mainstream we we read stuff in you know the book of kings or whatever about the destruction of jerusalem and we read in babylonian records about you know nebuchadnezzar destroying jerusalem and we think well these are probably talking about the same thing and from that, we we give it a date based on. So we give the event in the Bible that's got its own sort of date in terms of the, you know, whatever, um, however many years into this king's reign, this event happened. You then correlate that with a debate uh, with a date in, you know, from Babylonian history that, that you know, has its own B.C. date. And. You know, we see that as a perfectly sensible, normal thing to do. We're correlating the Bible's history with external evidence outside. And obviously, if th- there's potential for what is w- what you see in this external evidence outside to potentially conflict with what the Bible says. So, you know, you've got the potential for having the reliability of the Bible challenged. But equally... The fact that you're trying to make these correlations and show that these things can match, it's it shows that the Bible is a book dealing with reality. This isn't fairy stories. This is talking about the same history that we read of in, in other sources. It's a book dealing with reality. But but the flip side of that is always that you are then vulnerable to being challenged. But to me, that's, that's um, you know, the, the trade off that, that we have to have. And so when it comes to origins, I'm saying, well, the Bible talks a lot about people, talks a lot about humanity. Um, what do we see in the, um, you know, archaeological record? Well, we see lots of evidence of people. Um, we go back in time, we see different hominin creatures. How do these things relate to what we find in the Bible? That, that is not an odd question to ask. And, and if you like, what I'm trying to do then in the rest of the paper is say, well, look, these are the sort of, this is the, the the theological framework the Bible gives us, how does this match with what we see uh, from this external external evidence, sorry, outside the Bible? Gotcha. Yeah, and I think that, like you said, it's something that we kind of have to wrestle with because of the fact that the, the Bible is a book that is grounded in reality. And that's a good thing, but it certainly has its liabilities. For sure. Uh, all right, good. Yeah. So let's let's go ahead then and uh, and and move on and we are going to kind of when we when we get to the scientific part we'll probably uh, retouch on this again when it comes to the fact that you've got you know uh, long ages to deal with uh, potentially in in extra biblical information so we, we will revisit that with with a closer kind of getting to the meat of the issue let's take a detour now to your second part which is the theological attractiveness. And um, I, I'd love for you to just kind of um, walk us through this section. Uh, you open it up uh, by telling us about like a series of theological arguments that are based on the Bible's 
chronology. And um, you, you do this. Yeah, the Bible's yeah. sort of Bible whole sort of storyline, we can think of it. So it's, it's yeah. not about, you know, a single verse, a single passage. It's about the whole sort of storyline of the Bible. And, and I'm really looking at three different doctrinal arguments that are, in a sense, independent of each other. Yes. And I'm saying they all we get the same conclusion for each. So even if you think one of these arguments is a bit weaker, well, what about the other two? Um, you, you've got, it's all lining up in the same way is what I'm trying to argue. Sure, sure. And, 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 and we could be pretty upfront about it that the idea is to show incompatibility with kind of the conventional evolutionary yeah. storyline. These, these you believe, and I believe are conflicting storylines and, and, um, what you do here is try to demonstrate that theologically. And, and let me just kind of provide an am- admonition to uh, those listeners who both agree and disagree that it's really easy to get caught up in, in, uh, in arguments from the text and in apologetics and things like that. But really what we want to do is just we want to have a coherent theology. We want to have a theology that yeah, allows us to provide an answer, but more importantly than that, that uh, preserves the goodness of God, that preserves the authority and the inspiration of, of the scriptures and even the beauty of the story. Really, all of these things are affected, and they are the reason why we spend time on this issue. Yeah. If this was a completely secondary thing, we, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. Um, we think it's important to the actual issue, and so that's why we spend the time on it so i'm just going to kind of let you get and started um sorry, yeah, go ahead. I, I just and, and it's a really enriching theology um you know some of the, the way the debate goes is 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 terribly tiresome mm. uh, and it's but but the sort of stuff what i put put thought into some of these things put this stuff together this is this is um stuff making you worship this, this is this is yeah. rich stuff and and to me this is just part and parcel of of, of being a creationist so um, but anyway, so we, we need to explain to people what the arguments are. So, Perfect. Yep, yep. Okay, so I'm going to let you kind of walk through this section. And I did write down some questions. I'll just kind of interject those as we go. Okay. But let's get started. Okay, so I mean, the first the first title is Humanity After Adam. And, and remember, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to compare the Bible's chronology with, if you like, evolutionary chronology. So if you're thinking that we can combine some, how compatible are they? Which, because if you're basically taking a theistic evolution position, you're saying these two chronologies can be combined. And I think people often think the issue is about is Adam historical, and that is uh, is certainly important. If you don't have an historical Adam, I think that's that's you're you're in deep trouble. But actually, there's a lot of theistic evolutionists that would agree with me that yes, of course, Adam's historical. We need a historical Adam. So I'm almost taking that as a given here. I'm, you know, we could make that argument, but I, I'm not making that argument. I'm just assuming that. The issue is much more, not so much was Adam historical as was Adam alone. Did Adam have parents, if you like? So imagine sort of two different, uh, two different chronologies here, two different, two different histories. The one that I think the Bible teaches is that Adam has no parents. So Adam is, is specially created. Every human being is physically descended from Adam. Um, and therefore, that makes sense of why Adam is our representative of all humanity, because we're all part of Adam's family. There's something objective, something physical about that. And it means as well that Adam was made from the beginning as the image of God. From, from the moment of his creation, he is he, he's made as the image of God. So that's that's what I think the Bible, the Bible teaches. Now, if you try and bring in evolution, you have to have some sort of continuous chain between the animal kingdom and humanity. And in that situation, if you're saying that Adam is a historical person, you basically have to take um, one of these sort of hominin creatures uh, and say, you are special, you are Adam, you are going to represent the human race. And that, I think, has has problems. Because it means that this this creature who, who would have all the same physical capabilities as, as humans today, the same intellectual, emotional capabilities, exists quite happily without being the image of God. He can He can talk, he can sing, he can dance. Uh, he can marry, he can do all sorts of things without being 
the image of God. And then one day God gives him this status, which essentially is a spiritual status. And it's arbitrary. Why pick Adam as opposed to any of the people around him? And the big problem you have with that theologically is how do I know I'm the image of God? Because if it was just um, granted to Adam arbitrarily, there's nothing objective you can point to that, that shows you are the image of God. I don't know God's decrees. So how do I know that I'm the image of God? How do I know that my friend down the road is the image of God? You've got a real problem in, in actually how you define humanity. And, and so often we, we talk today you know, glibly about, you know, that the value of humanity is the image of God, but no one ever actually asked the question, who is human? And that to me is, is if we're thinking about the right questions to ask, that is the first question to ask, who is human? Because you can't answer that question by saying homo sapiens. That isn't, that isn't a biblical, or you can't answer that from a biblical point of view with that answer, because, you know, homo sapiens don't appear in the Bible uh, as, as a scientific uh, term. So biblically, how is humanity defined? The only definition I can find is those who are physically descended from Adam. So, so it's, it's that sort of view of humanity, I guess, I'm, I'm starting with. Yeah, and I, I don't want to derail you, but um, that it occurs to me that this might be another one of those times when, uh, when, when you have people who will affirm a, th a theology a particular kind of theology, but then they'll also affirm things like theistic evolution, for example, that actually, if they were to dig into the details, conflict because of questions like that. Who is human? Now, yeah. um, as and I think this is what, what you often find, that it, it sounds all straightforward. Oh, it's okay. Let's just take one of these people and say they're the image of God. You know, people like John Stott and other very eminent Christian thinkers have, have you know, proposed things like that. Right. But it's it's as you work through the implications and work out, well, hang on, how does that actually really work? You see, to me, it, it unravels very quickly. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I wish that more people took the time to think through that. Um, but certainly that's 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 true that you're going to have to answer. You're going to have to wrestle with some of those questions if you if you want to affirm both of these things in tandem you're going to have to to work through that um I mean, so i guess I, go ahead. I haven't really finished the argument in terms of well what's the, the how does this relate to the age of the earth yes go ahead um and if i'm saying that humanity comes after adam then there's issues of, of dating because you know what do we do with different hominins that we we dig up now you know Christians as creationists sometimes um, you know go on about all these hoaxes and things and you know, things like Piltdown Man uh, and, and I think I almost haven't quite appreciated that that actually these creatures these fossils are real you know we, we can dispute what they are but but they really you know are creatures that existed and if they are human I'm arguing they must be after Adam I mean let's take, take some specific examples something like Neanderthals about which we are discovering more and more and more, they were make people pretty much like us. And this is this is the the scientific consensus in you know in the mainstream now that Neanderthals you could basically put them in a suit, give them a shave, stick them on the underground in London, and no one really would notice. And and they behave very much like us. You know they use they use tools, clothing, music, culture, buried their dead. Um, and my question would be well. How on earth can you say these are not human? These are not spiritual people. You know, what evidence would would it take to persuade you that that um, that these creatures were, were really humans? But the problem is then, you know, Neanderthals died out um, 25,000 years ago. They, they date back hundreds of thousands of years. If they're human, they need to be after Adam. In which case, Adam is now going to be hundreds of thousands of years ago. And I don't see quite how anyone can argue genealogies can be stretched uh, that far back. And, and it gets even worse than that because creatures like, you know, Homo erectus, again, the more we discover about these, these creatures, the, the way the discoveries are coming out these days, they're showing more and more advanced capabilities. They, they, they used fire, it seems, for cooking. They made shelters. It seems like they crossed water. These were people that seemed pretty much like us 
on what basis are we saying uh, they're not human? But if Homo erectus is human and therefore a descendant of Adam, you're going to have to put Adam back over two million years ago. So is that really how far you want to stretch the genealogies? And I suppose this is this is the point. If you want to keep the relative the, the relative chronology so that humanity is coming after Adam, you're having to stretch the absolute chronology to ridiculous bounds. If you go the other way and say, well, let's place Adam, you know, a few thousand years ago, you're having to say that people like these Neanderthals weren't human. And that's not just a sort of hypothetical, slightly irrelevant issue, because there's an awful lot of people in the world today, a lot of Europeans and Asians who have Neanderthal DNA in them. We are the offspring of interbreeding between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. In which case, if those Neanderthals weren't human, then presumably, biblically speaking, they were animals. In which case, an awful lot of us around today are the fruits of bestiality. How does that work spiritually? Right. What's what's the what's the spiritual state of a uh, of a of a human being, um, or, or of a person descended from a from a <laughs> from, <laughs> from the mating of a human being and an animal? Um, I don't really want to go there. Right. <laughs> problem you go that that's you know if, if you mess up that relative chronology that's the problem you have you know a uh there's a, a view now and i don't know how much you you've looked into this i mean it's so new i'm not even sure the book is actually out yet uh but i think it's based on an older idea but it's kind of a, a resurgence of it based on new science um that is coming out that it, it, it deals with what the author of the book calls a, a genealogical Adam. That is, he, he makes a distinction, okay, between a genetic Adam and a genealogical Adam. And, and what, what he does is he says, well, it, it, we want to affirm that there was a literal historical Adam and that all humanity alive today has descended genealogically from this Adam, which the author purports was created specially created by god inside of the garden in fact by all intents and, for all intents and purposes um l let's just say it this way he wants to take the beginning of the chapters of the bible fairly literally i mean he wants to he wants to keep he wants to even keep the timeline around six thousand yeah. years he wants to do all of this but he's a scientist and he wants to say that outside of the of this special habitation outside of the special garden that we did have these um kind of just genetic adam and 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 animals and things like that that lie outside of this genealogical adam view and he says that we can place these side by side affirm everything we want to in scripture and also affirm evolutionary timelines and chronology because they're un unrelated I, I realize some of what you said already has implications for that but did you have anything specific to that that you want you'd want to point out yeah, I mean, it's not so different to lots of other schemes that have been presented. And I think the common feature of these sorts of things is, is you're left with the question of well, why you're constructing a, a very um, complex scenario, actually, to basically avoid problems. It's, right. it's actually totally ad hoc. You're constructing a scenario to ensure that there's no way that anything an evolutionist says can contradict the Bible. You're trying to sort of dehistoricize the Bible. You're saying, yes, technically it's historical. This happened. It's just there's no way you could ever find any evidence for it to test it. So there's no connection between the Bible and any real historical evidence. And to me, that's a total own goal. It means we are sort of uh, insulating the Bible from any connection to reality. And I'm not sure that it it actually really works anyway. So I mean, that's more of a general point about scenarios like this. Because to keep to keep the um, the whole point is you're you're wanting to affirm the evolutionary chronology, so you must have a whole chain of creatures going back, you know, to to uh, ancestors of apes or whatever, going all the way back, going coming all the way forward to to human beings like us. So they're all existing outside the garden. Well, presumably Adam must be the same anatomically as you know some of those people around why is is then you know 
presumably then you have Adam in the garden as someone that is perfect, someone, I presume in this scenario, death free, no suffering. Well, why, why would the suffering of Adam in the garden from terminal cancer be a terrible evil when someone outside the garden who is anatomically, intellectually, emotionally identical to Adam be be of no moral consequence if they were to undergo that same same suffering why is it a terrible evil for adam but not for these creatures outside who technically in this argument are not humans um that doesn't that doesn't make sense and i think it, it means as well that that the sort of hominin fossils that we dig up have no connection with us at all because in this argument you're saying that that we are all just descended from this Adam in the garden. So all these other hominin fossils we dig up that seem very much like human beings like us have got nothing to do with us at all. And you're then also left with this problem of the Neanderthals, I think, and the fact that, well, actually, we've got some of their DNA. So how do they fit in with this this scenario? I think that actually is a bit of a, a killer blow to, to, to this sort of argument. Yeah. So I'm not... It, it, it's one of these things you think, oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, we, we, can, we solved the problem, but you've solved the problem by a totally ad hoc uh, scenario that I don't think actually really does solve the problem. Right, right. Okay, good. Uh, excellent. Well, um, let's move forward then. So you, we've talked about humanity after Adam being one kind of uh, potential issue here. How about the next one? You mentioned the global flood after Adam. Yeah, um, there's... There's different uh, aspects to this argument. Let, let me pick out the sort of the, the central thing here really is that if we're thinking about the questions to ask, well, who does the gospel apply to? That is actually the central question here. And people think, what, what are you on about? You're talking about the flood. How's that got any connection with the gospel? Well, you find after the flood that the, the blessing that's pronounced onto the world is is upon the people and animals that have come out from the ark. People, so we think, just think about the people for now, who are descended from uh, from Noah and his sons. So if there's other people that exist in the world that were not include, that, so, say, so say you had a local flood um, where it, it didn't wipe out all of humanity apart from the eight in the ark, then you have other people that exist in the world that are not covered by those promises to Noah's sons and their offspring. So you got, you've immediately got a division in humanity between those who are covered under this blessing given to Noah and his sons and whoever else you have. But you also have a problem when it comes to Abraham, because the, the great promise to Abraham is that, that all nations will be blessed through you. That's picked up on again in the New Testament with the Great Commission about the gospel going to all the nations. Well, who are those nations? Well, the context in Genesis is very clearly links those nations to Noah's sons. So if you want to be included in the Great Commission, you have to be descended from Noah's sons. And you've got a real problem then if you have a local flood that didn't wipe out all of humanity because suddenly there's parts of humanity, maybe the aboriginals in Australia, for example, that are not included in this Great Commission. There's actually some real gospel implications for, for how you understand the flood and, and its extent. So now I brought that they, up I brought that up one time with an individual and they said, Well, what if we just say it's a really big local flood uh, that did wipe out all of humanity at, at the time? Uh, and they make the assumption that humanity was kind of isolated to one local geographic region. I mean, is there an argument there or is there a misunderstanding of the science there? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the Genesis text makes it clear this is a global event or at least as global as creation. It seems um, and actually this this was argued back in the Victorian era that um, that actually Genesis one was just a local creation and the flood was just a local local event. And to me, that's a consistent position. I'm not sure we really want to go there. Uh, to argue that Genesis 1 is only talking about the creation of a small part of the world. I think that has lots of problems, <clears throat> but that would be a consistent position. So it seems to me that the, the flood has to be as big as, as, 
as the creation. But I think when you think about, um, but the key thing, if you like, theologically, yes, is is that it's humanity that is wiped out in the flood. Now, the, the problem, so then you could say, well, OK, humanity clumped together. But, but at what point in history are, are you talking about? You're then having to start dating the flood because we have records, you know, they go back uh, at least 40,000 years. So you're going to have to put the flood presumably before that. Um, you, the- you had cut out, Stephen, there a little bit uh, just before 40,000 years. Um, did you mention a specific people group that goes back that far? I did, sorry. Yeah, let me... Let me just go back to the to the uh, to the Aboriginals again. Um, the Aboriginals in Australia they they, they go back um, at least forty thousand years. So okay. if you're saying that that they, um, if you have this scenario where all humanity was once you know in a small place together, that's going to have to be before those Aboriginals moved to Australia. So it's going to have to be back tens of thousands of years that you would have to place the flood. That, I think, is a bit of a problem for your absolute chronology uh, in the Bible. And and I think it's, it's that there's another sort of um, it's a bit like the question before about the, the genealogical Adam. It, again, it becomes a very ad hoc scenario to essentially avoid problems, because if you have a. Um, in one sense, you want a really small flood. To to minimize any sort of geological record of it really right but then if it's if it's a tiny flood that's you know 20 miles well why on earth are you building an ark why on earth aren't you just walking away <laughs> right. to avoid this? you know ha- you know how physically even can can this happen is it a is it a flood that's you know that's 400 miles across well again j- just physically how how do you have the geography that that allows that to happen a flood of that extent would start leaving some evidence and to, to actually have a, a, a flood that, that makes it meaningful to spend decades building an ark and, and, you know, getting all the animals and stuff needs to be pretty enormous. Right. In which case it's going to leave some geological evidence. So you're, to me, to go down this sort of route of a, of a, of a sort of a big local flood, well, how big, it, it creates as many problems as it solves, I think. Yeah, and uh, I would agree with that. And once you look at the, it's kind of another one of those internal argument things. Like you have to, you have to then say, okay, well, what does the Bible say about this flood that would potentially either support or falsify this position? And when you start looking at, you know, the fact that an ark was built, when you start looking at uh, geographical distribution of animals that you start having to redefine the word all right like uh, no not yeah. all of the animals under the whole heaven like no not it wasn't really that it was something else so you have to start adding words uh, really and taking yeah. away words uh, i don't think that works and i think you know, even from the new testament you know two peter sees three three acts of creation basically you've got the original creation the 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 decreation and recreation at the flood and then the new creation which are seen in parallel, and, and I think you, you have to look at these as being um, as, as extensive as each other. Yeah. So I think there are lots of arguments that line up as to why we need to see the flood as a sort of global event. Good but point. Guess, and, and Oh, go ahead, go ahead. But, but just so, so, I mean, there's a chronological point in terms of, well, what peoples are included in the Great Commission? When are you going to have to put the flood such that they could all be descended from Noah? You're going to have to put no, we're a long way back. Well, it gets even um, worse than that when you think of having Adam before the flood, which is what the the, the sort of heading is in in this section in in the paper. Because, and obviously, you, know, you think, well, that's obvious. Adam came before the flood, but understand, if the flood is a global event, that that in the geological record there are lots of massive you know, at least continent spanning catastrophes. But they all happen long before humanity was on the scene in the evolutionary chronology. To get those being um, somehow connected with the flood, 
you're going to have to place Adam hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of years uh, ago, which obviously is clearly ridiculous for your uh, absolute chronology. So it's the same pattern as we saw in the first argument. If you want to preserve your relative chronology for, for strong theological reasons, you are basically pushing Adam back tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of years. It becomes it becomes untenable. When I um, was first sort of looking into the sort of thinking more deeply about the flood, I, I was very surprised that there was almost no writing at all by creationists on sort of what the theology of the flood was, why the why the flood matters. Uh, um, and it was almost only sort of some of the liberal theologians that sort of thought about this stuff. There was lots of stuff by creationists on, you know, exegetical reasons why, you know, we should understand the flood as a global event, which were all very good 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 arguments yeah but nothing on on why it mattered and i think this is a big mistake because to a theistic evolutionist in a way you're ready to put up with some lousy exegesis if really you don't think it matters very much you know you can think well yeah the the exegesis it really probably is pointing to a global flood but if i can you know still squeeze a local flood in there <laughs> who so what it doesn't really matter it's still a judgment story we haven't mm. lost enough I think it's only if you can show the, 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 the theological significance of the size of the flood that people then stop to sort of almost then look at those exegetical arguments and think, well, yeah, this, this, really is, um, this really is important. So to me, in a bizarre way, almost the weakness in creationism can sometimes be the theology uh, rather than the science. Um, I actually think we've got some quite good science for, for, for some of this stuff. But I think some of the theological thinking has been quite superficial, and that's been something I've tried to uh, tried to address. Yeah, that that you know that makes a lot of sense. Uh, that makes a lot of sense to me because so many people talk about their main reason. Now, this isn't everybody, but so many people talk about their main reason for not being a young age creationist is just that the science doesn't lend itself to it but it seems to me that when you actually when you take when you take it, it at the level of worldview and you actually look at what is entailed by a worldview it, it seems to me that there is plenty of um good science that flows from and, and there's bad science too right that we've yep. seen we've yep. seen this but there's plenty yep. of good science that flows from a starting point of this, I'm just going to kind of package it nicely, of this chronological creationist yeah. v view that, 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 really gives, um, that really gives proper due, proper dues to the relative and absolute chronologies of the Bible. So let's, let's move on, unless there's more to say about that, then to, to the final part of this section, which deals with really uh, one of the main issues, which is death after Adam's yeah. sin. Yeah. So again, think of it as, as a question. You know, we've had who is human? Who does the gospel apply to? Well, the, the, the key question to ask here is, is why did Jesus die? And often in talks I do, I put up a slide that says, you know, the central question in the creation evolution debate is dot, 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 pause, get people to think. And then I put up the heading, why did Jesus die in brackets physically? Because it actually doesn't make any any sense as to why Jesus had to die physically if physical death has just been part of the world as it's always been from the beginning. And, and immediately, we're, I'll, I'll expand on that in a moment, but, but immediately in, in putting that as the question and saying it's about why did Jesus have to die? You can't say, well, this is a minor issue. This is this is this is you know way off beam to sort of Christian theology. <laughs> I mean, I mean this, this is at the heart of what we believe as Christians. And yes. I'm saying the creation debate directly relates to almost the central question of Christianity. And I think to to pose that, if if you ask the right questions, this is the position you come to. The problem is if we're asking about the length of the days, we're not we're going to miss that. So so to me, this is so important to understand that this is the uh, central question. And if you're accepting an evolutionary chronology, physical death has nothing to do with sin, in which case Jesus's death physically 
you could argue is part of his humanity because all human beings die or something. Uh, it's nothing to do with his atonement. He, he needed to, to die spiritually on the cross to, to bring about our atonement, but his physical death was unnecessary. Well, that changes a lot of Christian uh, theology and practice. For a start, it makes um, the cross about Christmas, not Easter. You know, it's about Jesus's humanity, not his atonement. Uh, it changes on the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is all about, um, you know, the the, the the bread representing a physical broken body, you know, physical blood being poured out is somehow seen as being pretty central to what we believe and something to remember. Well, that becomes pretty irrelevant if it's only spiritual death that has come through sin. And this isn't just sort of my theological theorizing. The New Testament actually says numerous times about how Jesus's physical death, physical suffering are part of the payment for sin. That, that's made explicit, Colossians 1.22, lot, lots of other references. And it also actually explains the logic of this. And I think this is where it almost gets back to the whole thing of methodology and chronology. The Bible is, is, uh, is, is giving a, a storyline. And in a story, you have you have events, you have, um, you know, the consequences of events, they come after the events, you know, you have problems, and you have solutions. These, these things have to be in the right order for the story to make sense, the chronology matters for this to all hang together. And that's exactly what we find in, uh, in the Bible, the way, for example, 1 Corinthians 15, 21, it, it explains Jesus' death in the context of the Bible story. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. So it's linking the physical death that comes through Adam with the physical resurrection that comes from Jesus. And I say physical because surely if we believe anything as Christians, it's in Jesus' physical resurrection. And that is placed as in parallel as the answer to what presumably must be the physical death of Adam. So to me, the argument I'm making here is actually totally explicit in the New Testament. And it's saying that the physical death has come uh, from sin. And that makes sense of why there's no death in the new creation, because it's dealing with the, um, the, 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 the problems that have been brought about by sin. And this is one of the problems, I think, with theistic evolution, is that the new creation is actually totally unconnected to Jesus's atoning work. It's sort of Jesus is it, it's sort of God's second bash at creation, the new creation. You know, he made, made the first creation that had death and suffering in it. But it's OK, there's going to be a new creation he's going to make. You know, second time round, he's going to do a better job. That's a pretty uncompelling gospel story, I think. Um, but but to me, the Bible's chronology puts it very differently. It's saying God's made a perfect world without death. Death has come in because it's our fault through human sin. And but God's providing the answer through the atonement of Christ that is not simply purchasing a spiritual salvation. It's purchasing a physical uh, restoration of the whole of creation. Right, because if something like your point really here is that if, if something like theistic evolution is true, then you've got death of people who are, I mean, in every respect that w we can think of, uh, human, happening before yeah. Adam's sin is, is the real yeah. issue. Yeah, and again, this, this is where the chronology comes in. Um, you know, what, what do you do with all these these fossils? Um, because not only do they exist, I think we would all have to agree they're dead. <laughs> uh, if, if they are human, again, let's just leave aside animal death for now. Just, just think about humans. If, if these fossils that we dig up are human, they must post-date Adam. So our Neanderthal friends, if they, we think, really were human, then you've got to put Adam before them. Uh, Homo erectus, people very similar to us, it seems. If they were human, you've got to place Adam before that because they are dead. So, so even ignoring the whole issue of animal death, you you are you've got a real issue with chronology. If you're say, if you're wanting to keep this um, uh, relative chronology, okay, so that 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 human death has come in after Adam's sin. That's the big relative issue of relative chronology. Then you, you've got to, you've 
you've got to have dates for Adam <coughs> that are hundreds of thousands, millions of years ago. That to me is such a conflict with the sort of absolute chronology we have in the Bible that on that reason alone, you have grounds to question the evolutionary dating. To say that Adam Lick existed two million years ago uh, is, is a problem. You, I'm saying that, that that dating that's assigned to these fossils, we have to question for that reason. Yes, yes. Well, that's great. So, so it kind of summarizing then that section, you know, the idea is that um, there are real problems when you start talking about Adam with the there are real theological implications for views that lie outside of what you're calling chronological creationism. Um, if we don't if we yeah. don't accept the fact that that we have to kind of do the dance between absolute chronology and relative chronology, then we have real issues theologically that get introduced and that that's really where the core issue is. That's where the debate really, really is, as you say. Yeah. I mean, basically, there's a tension between the relative chronology and the absolute chronology. So if, if you're trying to, to fit Adam into a, an evolutionary chronology, if you place Adam, um, you know, 6,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, you've got massive theological problems with your relative chronology. If, on the other hand, you, you try and reconcile those problems by placing Adam a long way back, to minimize those those problems of relative chronology, you've then got massive um, dating problems with your absolute chronology. So the fact that going either way doesn't work is telling me that these things are not compatible. That there's a this is the sort of point where it'd be helpful to show a, a, there's a slide I've got actually that just sort of diagramizes that that point that that um, I don't know if that could be included in your um, maybe what you present with the um, yeah I, I could I could send that to you but anyway so. That, that's the conclusion. You can't reconcile these two these two chronologies that they're not actually compatible. It's not as simple as people think. And, and I mean, if I can just come back just very quickly to the to this issue of, of death and just on the issue of animal death, people think that this is a bit sort of tenuous to talk about animal death. And I'm talking here about the death of, of, of higher animals. Um, you can define that in, in different ways. It doesn't really matter too much how you want to do that definition. But I think the Bible actually makes a very strong argument for animal death also being uh, connected to human sin. It comes out most clearly in the flood. The way that the in some of the Bible versions, this is smoothed out a bit, but it's uh, it's very clear that it's all flesh that is the problem in the flood there's violence in all flesh and the all flesh is defined in within the flood story as including animals as well as human beings god is grieved by the violence in animals that's why they are included in this uh, destruction as well oh, interestingly yeah. Good point. Look, sorry just just one other thing i mean again we, we 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 miss all this stuff about animals in the bible uh passover the passover included animals both in, in the destruction in Egypt, it included firstborn animals. Yes. Also, the rescue in the Passover included the firstborn animals in the um, Israelite homes. So there's this sort of connection, again, between the, the, the human sin and salvation and, and, and what happens to the animals. Yeah, because, so that, you, you know, that's... that's... Explored, um, I say a little bit about that in this paper. It's explored in some other writings I've done. Um, but yeah. I'm... But anyway, yeah. No, so, well, that, that's a good point it, because it often gets downplayed. Um, it's almost mm -hmm. treated as two separate, two separate things. Um, in, in other words, the issue of animal death is usually only treated insofar as it relates to the question of the timing of things. In other words, um, because of the fact that we have on evolutionary timelines, we have millions and millions of years of animals existing even before humans show up. So usually there is this kind of um, disconnection there made between animals and humans. They're treated as individual. But the Bible, and this is the point that I try to make to people, the Bible seems to make a very strong connection between them. It seems to me that if, yeah. they, if, they, if this were truly unrelated, then then it would be unrelated in the Bible. But they're always together, animal life Certain forms, higher forms of animal life yep. and human life are treated in connection in the Bible all throughout. Why is that? I think that's better explained on this view. Yeah. 
So let's talk about the next section in the paper, which is apologetic attractiveness. Now, this uh, we're going to talk about some things here that kind of start to dial in on things that we've mentioned a little bit so far. So to begin with that, you actually argue that adopting a position of chronological creationism makes apologetics easier and not harder. And I thought this was really ironic because you often hear, (laughs) just like what you mentioned earlier about the fact that you hear people say that the science is much more difficult to wrestle with for the young earth creationist, um, you say that it's actually the theological and biblical issues. You're kind of saying the same thing here because so many of them say that it's how can you how can you be an apologist if you can't affirm a big bang like like we like we we trust in these things. Um, yeah. How does it make it easier to adopt this view in your in your opinion? Yeah, I mean this this again is part of how I've construct, constructed the the paper. The, each of these headings, you know, the theological attractiveness, apologetic attractiveness, scientific attractiveness. I'm trying to make the point that actually this is an attractive uh, position as well as being being true. And I mean, I once years ago I once uh, had to uh, address a talk on with with the title that was something like uh, you know creation versus theistic evolution, you know, a choice. Uh, well, I guess it'd be the other way around, theistic evolution versus creation, a choice between heresy and apologetic suicide, you know, question mark, where, you know, creationism is seen as, yeah, theologically, we, we would all prefer to be creationists, but apologetically, it's a nightmare. Um, you know, theistic evolution makes apologetics a lot easier. Uh, yeah, theologically, we can see it's it's not ideal, but we'll probably live with it. I'm arguing, as you say, no, 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 creationism is, is far... far far better theologically and far better apologetically. And I think the reason, and and in a way the two go together, it's because our apologetics doesn't just sort of come in a vacuum. We're not just dealing with with isolated questions. Because the questions that we're answering, that we answer them out of a Christian worldview. They come out out of the whole sort of biblical package, which means different apologetic questions are interlinked. You can't... um, the way you answer the question about science, about origins, affects how you answer some of these other questions we're about to get onto about suffering and other things. So you might say, well, I'd prefer to go down the evolution route on the science. But I'm saying, but hang on a minute, look at the cost of that. Look at how how much harder that makes it for some of these other questions. And I would argue that the overall, even if you want to say that scientifically, you know, as a creationist, I'm I'm in a in a tricky position. Even if I granted that, to me, the overall whole apologetic package is still far more favourable as a creationist. Partly because the science questions can at least, in principle, be addressed with more research and more work. The problems about suffering and stuff, well, we've been wrestling with those for millennia. Right. I don't see how we're suddenly going to get some new insight that's going to make that um, less of a problem. So, yeah, and let's actually let's let's underscore that really quick um, because you're in a unique position in that you're a pastor, and there is to me there's not very much pastoral help that we get, you know, by giving science or, or, or mainstream science or however you want to put that kind of the veto power um, yeah. over theology here. Uh, yeah. it, it's not very pastoral to be able to, you know, sitting in a counseling meeting with somebody who's grieving because of the death of a loved one just to say, well, the scientific evidence seems to show that God just built death into the nature of, into the fab- fabric of creation. So this is how, I mean, that's not an yeah. answer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I totally agree, and I think that it's it's pastorally that that you think this this just can't can't work. And you know, I think the most the most obvious example is this whole issue of, of, of suffering, and it's and it comes up, and and, it's, and and I guess it's important people don't think that that somehow taking a creationist position means that that solves every aspect of the problem of suffering. No, no, there's still plenty of things we wrestle with, things that that are not are not easy, but I think it does enable us to address the problem of natural evil in a uh, in a in a in a satisfactory way uh, that doesn't happen if you accept theistic evolution i mean the, to me the classic example i don't know this was, was um widely shared in the uk how much i guess 
uh, well, there was a video by by a guy called Stephen Fry, who was a sort of intellectual stroke comedian, stroke actor, quite an influential figure in sort of the media and stuff. In, well, still is in in, in Britain. And he did a, an interview with an Irish broadcaster, I think it was, in 2015, where he he basically has a sort of big rant against God saying, well, you know, how can anyone believe in, in God or certainly his goodness um, if he creates, you know, children with bone cancer and that sort of thing? You know, how, how can he create a world that's that's so full of suffering? And this, you know, got got very widely shared. And it's he put very eloquently the, the classic objection that people make. And in a funny sort of way, he, he's right. He, he is right on his theology, because if this is what God made, if, is, if that is the sort of world God made at the beginning, then that does reflect on God's character. And I think this is actually a massive issue in Genesis 1. The, the, the big thing in Genesis 1 is, is, is actually the goodness of creation, because it's trying to connect what the creation with the character of the creator and i think there's actually lots of textual clues that are doing that for us so we haven't got time to go into that now but but that it's very much tying the creation to the character of the creator and that is the big issue for us today it's not so much does god exist it's is this a god i want to know it's god's goodness that is the issue for us today so so stephen fry i think is right on the theology that that if that is how the world was made then that is a problem for god's character um but i think he's wrong on his history it's right. because he's got his, his, his history wrong. The theology is wrong. That that isn't the history uh, of the world. So yeah, uh, and and, I, and I, I you're right. And I think that there's a great irony here. The great irony is that many times the um, ap- those apologists and uh, you know scholars who want us to shift the conversation away from any kind of scientific well, well first let me just start with this you know there is this misnomer that the young age creationist thinks that Genesis 1 is all about science or that Genesis 1 through 11 is all about science yeah. that that is not the case number one let me just say that um, yeah. it's yeah. about history it's about the right understanding of history and the irony yeah. is that there are those who the same people who make that mistake want us to disconnect Genesis, early Genesis, to sum it up, want us to disconnect that uh, from our discussions of things happening in the real world, evolution versus creation. They And, and they say, oh, this is the irony, they say that you're distracting from the theological beauty and significance of these chapters. And what I want to say is that the issue is you want to make a mountain out of the theology and that and you're saying that kind of the, the the stuff that we're focusing on is the molehill but i think that without the details of the molehill you can't make a mountain out of the theology i think the theology suffers if the historical implications are not dealt with it biblically the right way definitely so, and again it's it's, it's you know, christian theology is founded on history that's that's almost the point i should have brought out at the beginning that that is so crucial um our, our theology depends on the history god's character depends on the history i mean I, I often you know describe that the history in the bible is god's cv this is this is telling us something about who god is you know so he, he's he's rarely described in abstract terms you know in exodus 20 i'm it's not I'm the, the gracious God, the God with all these attributes. I'm the God that got you out of Egypt. It's, it's you know, something really concrete and, and, and sort of basic and, you know, well, that's the sort of God I want, the God that got me out of Egypt. And and so if you then say, well, actually, the Exodus never happened. <laughs> right. What, what have you done? You've changed God's CV. God, you've changed wow. God's character. God is now different. Because he's no longer the God that actually did that event in history. And, you know, you can still argue God is gracious or whatever, but it hasn't got the same sort of historical grounding and earthing to that. Yeah, and I, you're right. I, I love the Exodus example because there are those who want to deny that event. But I was thinking as you were saying that of this, I think, is often what happens when, and I'm okay with philosophy. I, you're an intelligent guy. I'd like to think I'm an intelligent guy. I, I think that we all understand that that doing philosophy is is unavoidable. Philosophy is a is a is a good thing, but a lot of times there 
is philosophy that is invoked to answer some of these questions rather than a rich kind of biblical theology, for example, rather than argue about the historical fall um, that introduced sin and therefore death into the world, the philosopher may simply want to say something like use uh, like Planiga's free will defense or something to say, well, it, yep. it, it could be true that in any any possible world that that or any feasible world that God creates that that includes free creatures that that there will be those who sin in the world and therefore cause death and destruction. And to that, I would say, well, philosophically, that's right, but that doesn't deal with with the biblical arguments it doesn't because it doesn't deal with the biblical uh history really it doesn't truly deal with a holistic christian theology yeah. and it's not very pastoral In, yeah and i think i'm not sure the bible presents the free will defense as its uh you know argument about about suffering true, it's, not, true. it's not entirely there's aspects of it that I think are there, but it's not presented as as the sort of answer. It's, it's a slightly different. But anyway, that, yeah, that takes fair that enough. Takes other directions. I mean, I mean, just to sort of finish this, because it is it is in a sense the the biggest issue. This issue of, of, of suffering. I think if you're taking a theistic evolution point of view, you you either have to say that things like suffer, things like cancer, are actually what God declared very good you end up having a choice between a god who is who is wicked or stupid um either you say that you know if the world is fine as it is and you're saying well actually you know cancer is is good um then why do we need an answer to it why do why is god producing a solution to a non-problem um if you're saying well actually no cancer really is bad but that's what god made then you've got a god that surely uh, is himself bad and that uh, which is how Stephen Fry would argue it. And so that sort of choice, to me, is not great apologetics to choose between a God who is wicked or stupid. Yeah, um, I, okay, let me ask you this, just to see your thoughts on it. Um, when, when you were saying that, I thought about, well, what about those, because I, I hear this argument from theistic evolutionists and from other kinds of old age creationists, they'll say something like, well, when God said it's very good, he wasn't necessarily speaking of moral perfection. He was saying that everything is functioning according to his design and intent. Uh, to me, that's not very pastoral either, but it's their argument. You don't have any thoughts about that, do you? Yeah, well, I think you have a bit of a moral problem there because, um, you know, a machine gun uh, can, can function well as a machine gun. Uh, that doesn't mean to say it's a particularly good thing. Um, so, you know, God could have made a world that's, that's functioning perfectly in that sense, um, very beautifully engineered, but it's uh, a place of death and destruction. You, you know, you still got that that moral problem. Um, and I think it, it it well, I think the other problem is that that the way this this word, the way that the way good is used in Genesis one is, I think, very much tied to God's character. Um, this is something we could we could explore. But I mean, just very briefly, that the whole if you actually look at the literary structure in Genesis 1, of which there is plenty, there's lots of literary structure in Genesis 1, uh, but that has absolutely no bearing at all on how historical something is. You know, you can you can write a poem about something historical, okay? The, what, what literary structure it is does not determine the historicity of the events it's talking about. But anyway, so there is lots of literary structure, and, and the, you know, some of the most obvious one is that God, um, God speaks. God says what he wants. God then looks at what, he's made and assesses it and then gives a verdict on it. So there's a very sort of close correlation between, if you like, what God wants, what he makes, and then assessing it in terms of it fitting with what he wants. And I think that pattern is establishing a very close connection between what God makes and his character. And I think there's there's other ways we we, we could explore that. But um, so so I think that, that line about goodness um, doesn't doesn't really work. But what I'm intrigued about on, on this sort of apologetics is how, you know, many uh, eminent great Christian apologists don't seem to have joined the dots on this. Um, you know, the, the example I sometimes give, and it's, this is in the, the in the paper, you know, Tim Keller, who who I admire greatly um, and 
learned a huge amount from, he wouldn't describe himself as a young earth creationist. And yet when he deals with the suffering question, he, he well, let me just read it out. He says, you know, human beings are so integral to the fabric of things that when human beings turn from God, the entire warp and woof of the world unraveled. Disease, genetic disorders, famine, natural disasters, aging and death itself are as much the result of sin as our oppression, war, crime and violence. That is an incredibly specific statement. The way he itemizes that. What he doesn't seem to have worked out is that if that is that is true, you are a young earth creationist because you know, any evolutionist would say, well, disease, genetic disorders, natural disasters and all the rest have been present for um, for millions of years. So if he's saying that all of that has come as a result of human sin, you have to be a young earth creationist. Um, so <laughs> and I don't he's know not. <laughs> whereas I, I mean, to me, I almost use that. that. That to me is the best definition I know of a young earth creationist. That quote from Tim Keller It's just that he hasn't seemed to have worked out that that means you have to be a young earth creationist. So if you want to give that answer, that's great. But understand that. You know, you give an answer to that in a talk, a thoughtful non-Christian will put their hand up and say, but hang on a minute. So that means you're you don't believe in evolution. And and people will. And I've heard examples of this people with other apologists where they've made that sort of response about suffering. And people say, but hang on a minute. That doesn't fit with believing in evolution. And uh, you've got to make your choice. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. And in fact, let's let's use that to kind of segue into the the next part of this, the next question I had, was you actually devote some time to sexual identity. And with respect to suffering, evil, sin, things of that nature, there is almost no issue, at least in America, that is more hot button right now than than matters (laughs) of than matters of 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 sexual identity. And in fact I think it's interesting that as you read through the Bible, um what you find is that not much has changed. Fundamentally, sin and rejection of God and God's judgment on people, all of these things often center around themes of sexual identity and and behavior, uh, yeah. suggesting that that's really an integral part to understanding even what it means to be made in the image of God, etc. C- can you explain some of your thinking here around the idea of sexual identity that you spend time on? Yeah, it comes back really to to how we understand uh, what it means for us to be the image of God. And and if you can think back to a while earlier in the conversation where I was talking about these two different views of humanity, um, one that I think is the, the biblical one where, where Adam is alone, uh, he's the first human being, he is made from the beginning as the image of God, body and soul. Um, this, this point I didn't really make before that it is it is not just a spiritual quality our our bodies also image god that is a mainstream christian way of thinking and you think well how do our bodies image god god doesn't have a body but the capab- our, our bodies uh, enable us to to do things that reflect god's capabilities so for example um there's psalm um is it, i've got this written down here somewhere that i now can't find but um psalm is it 94 um you know, he who made the ear, does he not hear? Who made the eye, does he not see? And so, so God is is able to do those things that we accomplish with with, with bodies. So, in that sense, we we reflect God. I think it, it actually relates back to Christ Himself. That uh, you know, Christ is the image of God, and are we saying that His body is somehow unconnected to His identity? Is the image of God. I think ultimately, as well as human beings, our humanity is modelled on that of Christ. But that that gets us into more interesting um, theological areas. So, um, where are we? Yeah, question was about sexual identity, wasn't it? So, so the image of God is something intrinsic to us. Okay, our whole being, body and soul. If you take the view that Adam had parents, Adam was one among many. So you're fitting Adam into an evolutionary scenario. You are. You are saying the the image of godness is something that is added. You 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 have a um, a creature that exists that again is physically, emotionally, intellectually identical to us. Someone who can sing, who can make up stories, who can um, plan things, make stuff, and and yet he is not the image of God until one day he is given that spiritual status as the image of God. So it's something that's added to him. He's able to exist without being the image of God. 
but then this spiritual status is added to him. Right. What does that then do to your sexual identity? Because in Genesis 1, 27, our image of godness is expressed in parallel with our male and femaleness, which hmm. to me, if the parallels work through, if our image of godness is something purely spiritual, purely this sort of status somehow that's conferred upon us, then the same must apply to our maleness and femaleness. That is simply almost a decree of God or some sort of spiritual thing about us. It's nothing to do with our bodies. And you can see the problem with that. That is exactly what transgender activists say. Right. They say our maleness and femaleness is a purely, they probably wouldn't use the word spiritual, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a non-physical thing. And to me, once you start saying the image of God is just this thing that can be added to a human being, then you you are actually opening the door to that way of understanding for our sexual identity. And I don't think that's a route that uh, many Christians would want to go down. But it's another example of where there's this trade off. You, you go down, well, let's accept evolution. That makes life simpler here. Boy, it gives you a big problem when you're dealing <laughs> with, with um, you know, with these issues of sexuality. Well, it's, yeah, it's especially the yeah, consistency of, of Christian theology. Sorry, go on. No, that's fine. I was just going to say that that's especially significant given the fact that uh, uh, apologists are working overtime answering uh, answering questions of sexual identity. I mean that <laughs> that these days that is the hot button issue. That many times uh, apologists are uh, are having to deal with people who object to Christianity on the basis of what it says about our sexuality. Yeah. That's and, right. and at the same time, they want to affirm views of Scripture that would seem to cause problems uh, for, for their own defense. In other words, the person could, could just point out the inconsistency if they realized what was, you know, um, yeah. what the deal was. They could just simply point out that inconsistency. So um, I think that's a really good point. Is there anything else that you want to say about that section about the apologetic attractiveness yeah, in general, or do you think we covered it yeah, pretty but I well? Think it's sort of where I conclude that the problem with theistic evolution is that it ends up spiritualizing everything. You know, our our image of godness is something purely spiritual. You know, death from sin is purely spiritual. The, the consequences of sin are purely spiritual. And that puts you in a safe space. Um, you can't really be challenged. Um, but it also makes you irrelevant. And it's, it's this trade-off. And I think almost historically, this has been the problem in the church, that one of the reasons people retreated to a sort of almost a spiritualized theology in the you know, with the rise of higher criticism was there are all these challenges on the historicity of the Bible. So people thought, well, let's just keep the essential theology, not worry about the history. And in a sense, yes, that insulates you from those historical attacks because you say, well, it doesn't actually matter whether these things happened or not. It's the theology that we're worried about. But of course, that totally undercuts Christianity because Christianity is totally based on history. Right. But see, with the resurrection, but actually it applies all the way through. This is my whole argument. Theology comes from history. And that is and that undercuts the thinking today that, that Christianity is this personal lifestyle choice, that it's something private and individual. You know, that, that's fine if you've got those beliefs, people will say, you know, that, that that's great. It's just something private and eternal to you. But the great thing about the history of the Bible is that it connects us to reality. But it means we're open to challenge because people can say, but hang on, that history you're talking about in the Bible, that doesn't fit with what we see over here in this evidence. You know, and, and you're open to that sort of challenge. But equally, the, that also means that people can see you're talking about reality. And that to me is so important today that, that we, we show that our Christian beliefs have real purchase on reality. So you know, we warn about the dangers of, of spiritual judgment. Well, that has a lot more traction, I think, when you can point out that actually you're standing on a whole pile of rocks that are the fruit of God's physical judgment yeah. on the, in the flood. You know, the, 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 what we're talking about here is real. You know, however arrogant or narrow minded or um, homophobic or whatever else you might think Noah was, if you weren't in the ark, you drowned. And that's what we're talking about in the gospel. We're talking about truth and reality like that. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it because it seems that what you're 
what you're saying is that if you don't if you don't have a view that can square um, successfully with um, between between the biblical history and between the world out there, so to speak, that it really just kind of devolves into relativism. Uh, it's kind of the logical fruits of it. So we certainly yep. want to avoid that. Very good. Okay. Let's use that as kind of a segue then because you were talking about uh, the flood and you were talking about the rocks and things like that. Uh, this is really where a lot of people think the debate centers around, and, and you, you actually had, had touched on this a little bit uh, earlier, that um, the mistake is made when people think that the issue is all about science. And if I'm not mistaken, you, your view, um, as I read the paper and as I talk to you, is really that uh, once we get the, the theology and the history right, um, the science really isn't that big of a challenge at all. But we realize that there is a there is a challenge to it, and it's not it's not totally benign. So let's talk about this kind of final section of the paper, which is uh, the scientific attractiveness. Lay the foundation yeah. for us here. Like, how is your model here going beyond kind of the standard creationist rhetoric of decades past? Yeah, I mean, I think Pat, so I slightly disagree with what you just said there about that the the there aren't sort of or the science things aren't so so great i think there are there are you know very big scientific problems and things that are unanswered things that 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 we haven't addressed um you know that those are formidable yeah oh right. yeah 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 let me just let me just reiterate or, or uh, clarify i certainly think that there are there are issues and i'm on record as saying saying as such i'm just meaning that yeah. it, the the debate usually centers around the scientific yeah. attractiveness whereas it should should center around more important issues of theology that's all yeah i mean my, my, i think my issue is is how we address the scientific issues and and i think an awful lot of creationism actually isn't creationism it's anti-evolutionism hmm. um, all people are concerned about is to find some arguments that can poke holes in evolution and you know there's there's plenty of you know things you can you can do that and, and that has a you know has a place you know there's different types of tactics there's different things that are appropriate in diff different settings but um in a sense i don't want to be driven by an evolutionist agenda i'm not um i'm not totally excited i mean people often are excited they want an enemy to attack don't they? <laughs> um, yeah and that, that's what energizes people well actually i don't think that is should be what energizes us as christians i think we should think boy god is the creator of this world he's made me um as his image with capabilities to understand this world he's made that will enable me to 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 understand something more of God's glory. You know, it's it's um, Psalm 100. And, I'm forgetting all the Psalms now. 100, 112, isn't it? You know, um, we, we delight in the works. Psalm 111, verse two. Here we go. Greater the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. That should be the motto of, of, of every Christian. And obviously some people are going to do that much more than others or are gifted in that way. But, but this whole sort of positive idea of, well, let's, let's you know, let, the glory of understanding uh, God's world and doing it using the framework that he's given us in his written word. Um, you know, he's there's loads of stuff he doesn't tell us in the Bible. I used to be a material scientist. He, God doesn't tell me anything about the dislocation mobility, uh, dislocation mobility and body centered cubic metals. Um, I'm going to have to work that out by doing doing some science. But there are some things that are addressed from the from the history that's given in the Bible that relate to science. And so it seems to me, given we're told that directly, verbal communication uh, far clearer than trying to infer things from you know, the scientific process. Let, let's start from that as we start doing um, our science. So I suppose that the, the, the big thing I'm trying to emphasize is this whole idea of, of positive science. Well, how do we understand the world? How do we explain this stuff? So often Christians want to sort of explain evidence away. Oh, these fossils aren't really real or, you know, these th these rocks aren't really there or, you know, <laughs> or maybe not quite as bad as that. But um, we, we're trying to explain stuff away or this isn't really evidence for that. And actually, we should see all this evidence as God's evidence. And how do we explain this stuff? You know, this is really there's a fossil here. That's really interesting. How do we explain that? How does that fit with what God has said? And and it's that, it's that positive, um, what I would call model building approach, which I guess we, we sort of need to explain. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, that's great. That's a that's really good because that 
some people may or may not know, especially new listeners, that um, when I started uh, this podcast, so now the 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 just to, for consistency's sake, the, the show kind of um, follows my my namesake, and uh, I'm, I'm starting in 2020. This um, which is what it is when you're now listening. Um, I'm starting kind of a, a special kind of um, series on the show called. Uh, um, a creation conversation. So that's what this is a part of. We're we're having a, a you know a series that's going to be a special every now and then that, that deals with these subjects. But initially, this podcast started out being called the Creation Academy um, when I started it in 2017. And one of my I think it's my second episode. Um, it's my second or third episode. It's actually called the New Creationism. It's named after the the book uh, that your colleague uh, Paul Garner. Yes. Wrote. Yeah. yeah, and I, I actually started this podcast entirely and almost, I mean, I almost want to say that I got into the aspects of creation ministry entirely for this purpose because I'm not a scientist, no, um, but I am a person who is uh, passionate about seeing things in this world explained um, via, uh, you know, using the, the assumptions, if, so to speak, of a biblical worldview and, and and kind of the whole positive thing. So I actually started this podcast because I was tired of seeing only kind of anti-evolutionism um, in the in the ranks, and I wanted to see more people doing this. I wanted to see more people taking the route of positively explaining the world that, that we live in, and so I try to follow people who, who do that. Um, so... And expose others to people who do that. Yeah. So then let's talk more about this, about about model building and the fact that most people probably misunderstand really how science works. What, what is your approach here? Yeah. And again, this this is part of the, the methodology thing again. You know, I've tried to give a methodology for the theology, the, the methodology of the apologetics that's much more holistic. This this is the heart of the scientific methodology. And this and just to be clear, this this is mainstream science. This is how science works in the normal you know, course of science. This isn't some sort of creationist quirk. I'm just saying, actually, as a creationist, I'm doing science in exactly the same way as I would have done in my own scientific career. There's a few you know, caveats to that, which I'm sure we'll come to. But um, but it, the essential thing is is the same. And I think a lot of people don't really understand how science works. They think, and particularly how it relates to sort of evidence. They think, you know, what what's the piece of evidence that will disprove evolution? As if it's there's some sort of magic <laughs> bullet that can do it. And, and if you ask that question, you don't understand science. If you think that there is a, this sort of one piece of evidence that will destroy something, that isn't how science works, because it, it's not like arithmetic is, is the analogy I use. You know, with arithmetic, if you, you know, um, number A plus number B gives answer C and only answer C. And that's the only possible correct answer. But with science, you can have a piece of evidence, another piece of evidence. What does it mean? What's it telling you? Well, actually, it, it's consistent with it could be consistent with lots of different possible explanations. There's not only one right answer. Now, one answer might be more favoured over another for, for other reasons. But th there's not a, it's not a simple Well, this evidence and this evidence means this conclusion and only this conclusion. It's it's much more. And to me, this is this is the analogy. Um, it, being a scientist is like a detective solving a crime. A detective has different clues. You know, they, they find a body, they find, um, you know, a knife with blood on it or whatever. They, they, they find hair samples somewhere. They, th they find all these different bits of evidence and it's their job to come up with a story that connects those bits of evidence in the sort of least contrived, most sort of economical way. Well, that's what a scientific model is. It's, it's if you like a story that's connecting different bits of data. And you know, we, we all know from detective programs on the telly, but also real real life, you know, crimes, you can sometimes think, well, it's obvious, isn't it? It's obvious, you know, the butler did it or whatever. Um, you know, look, look, you know, look what we see in this evidence and this evidence. And of course, the whole story, the whole plot, you know, rests on the fact, well, actually, it's not as obvious as you think. You've missed this piece of evidence that actually casts a totally different light on the conclusion. Right. And I think that's very similar to how science works, that you can have, well, it, it, this is clearly the right explanation until someone discovers something else and you think, boy, that doesn't fit. Um, we're going to have to rethink this this whole story. So, and I think what's, what's so helpful about that approach is that it, it is that 
it means it's not a mystery that there are plenty of things that fit really well with evolution. Yeah. But creationists um, don't like me saying this often um, when I say there is lots of good evidence for evolution. Mm. But it's a false theory. You can't say that. How can there be good evidence? (laughs) You don't understand how science works. Yes. Yes. You have evidence for things that are wrong. Just as a detective, you know, in their first scenario, it was a murder. There was evidence for that. There was knife on the, there was blood on the knife. You know, that that fitted with their scenario of murder. But it's when you looked at some other bits of evidence, you realize actually that isn't the best explanation. Right. Uh, Like like you have, I have to say you have facts and then you have interpretations of the facts that could go in a number of directions given a bunch of other facts and their interpretations. It's a very complicated process, really. And, And so often it depends, you know, you often have a story in your head and that means that you look in certain places for mm. clues. But if you've got the wrong story, you're likely to miss actually some other vital clues because you're looking in the wrong place. And again, this can happen as, as scientists because you're, you're, you, you think it's, it's this sort of explanation. You don't actually, you miss some of the available evidence. You never even thought that it might be relevant. And the wonderful thing about some of the creationist work is that it's it's opened our eyes to to other evidence. So, you know, work that's been done in the Grand Canyon and stuff where people have looked for things because of their belief in the flood, because they were thinking, well, look, uh, you know, from, from our reading of the Bible, we think what we're seeing here is is evidence of a, a massive catastrophic flood. If that's the case, we would expect to find these fossils not just here, but over in this place, too, uh, and in this place. And lo and behold, you go and do that. You go and do that work. Oh, look, they are all over here. Actually, this is a much bigger event than the secular geologists had, had thought of. We found that evidence because we knew where to look, because we had a different story. That doesn't prove the flood. You know, none of this stuff sort of means that, that you know, our beliefs are proved somehow. You can't prove the Bible through science. But it can inspire good science that is actually for the benefit of everyone. And this is what I sometimes like to argue, you know. Uh, it hasn't, hasn't some of this creationist research actually enriched the world of science? Even if you think we're totally crackpot, even if you think we're the most misguided uh, whatever people on the planet. Well, isn't it good that Stephen Austin and Kurt Wise have, have, have you know, charted what this nautiloid population looks like in the Grand Canyon? Now, isn't it good that Paul Garner and his colleagues have, have uh, shown that actually the sandstone in the Coconino sand is actually a water deposited sand? Um, it may have been inspired by beliefs that you think are crazy, but it's for the benefit of all. And, um, you know, we, we can actually learn from one another. And it's, and it's almost quite hard to argue against that, to say, well, we should shut this down. We shouldn't let these people do that research. You know, yeah. surely it's actually good for everyone if people are investigating things from different perspectives. Yeah, yeah, and just to kind of you know tie that up with a bow, uh, you mentioned Kurt Wise. I once heard him make this analogy, and honestly, I don't. I've thought about it before, but I don't know that I would have ever made this analogy had I not heard somebody with the sheer intelligence of, of Kurt Wise make it first. <laughs> so I'm kind of resting on on his uh, on his Harvard uh, Harvard uh, laurels here, but um, you know. With respect to the issue of evolution, he has used the analogy of noodles. I mean, you could seriously take boxes of noodles and you could yeah. arrange them in such a way that sure. looks like an evolutionary kind of progression. I mean, really, you could, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, but those same boxes of noodles could uh, just as easily as they could be um, leveraged in support of the tree of life, they could also be leveraged in support of what uh, Todd Wood and, and Kurt Wise and those guys yeah. for, would call the orchard of life. So, so you could see how the same yeah. facts can be used to support different hypotheses hypotheses and, and none of that sort of makes science sort of totally sort of relative that that well you you know everything's consistent with everything and you know right. you, i mean you can still prefer or think some scientific explanations are better than others because of maybe their economy of explanation the amount of things they explain you know what whatever factors you want to you want to bring in but all i'm saying is that there is that there is always room for for other models that you may not have conceived of yet. Um, so when we think, how on earth are we going to explain this stuff? Well, sometimes 
the, the answer, if you like, is when there's a conflict between science and the Bible, it's not to say science is evil or shut down science or don't touch science because it will wreck your faith. But that, that is a terrible way of thinking. Rather, the answer is, well, let's do some more science. You know, um, if, if there's a problem here, we need to do some more research. We need to look at this more. And the, what I find so encouraging about creationist research is there's sometimes problems that seem, you know, insurmountable. But actually, when they start to be addressed and tackled, boy, we actually we don't just unearth more and more problems. We tend to actually the, the problems tend to get smaller over time as actually we think, well, actually, yeah, we can start to explain more of this. Uh, and and I sometimes um, and again, Christians that they they want to win. They want to think I've got all the arguments to to sort of destroy evolution. I, I think we should basically be aiming for a draw. You know, if we can show that, you know, evolution can explain certain things really well, but it's got some you know, big problems in these areas. If we can almost do the same thing for creationists, say, well, actually, look, look at these things here. We can actually explain that better as a creationist. You know, isn't, isn't that interesting what we can explain? Yeah. Here? But there's these problems here we, we haven't resolved yet. You know, recognize that uh, we're open about that. Um, that. That there's some sort of. Um, not necessarily equally valid but you know scientifically speaking you know th these have both got something going for them that they shouldn't be shouldn't be dismissed so in that sense we're sort of aiming for a draw and when you think that as creationists how few of us there are how little resource there is you know how 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 tiny if you like the research effort is compared to the sort of whole evolutionary establishment then it's actually quite impressive, I think, some of the stuff that's been achieved and, and that what has been discovered. But I would never want to, you know, minimize that, you know, the, the plenty of problems remain. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. And I was just thinking about um, the fact that because of this whole idea where creationism of the past has been sorely focused on why everybody else is wrong, uh, a lot of people get the idea that creationists don't ever challenge their own views critically or, or, or try to, to do the science, the hard work of poking holes in their own, um, uh, their own models. And, and I'm reminded uh, just because of context of the work that your colleague Bill Worker is doing, for yeah. example, right now yeah. tackling, you know, we, you know, th the short version is we recognize that in our model of, of plate tectonics, there is a, a huge problem of heat. Where did all the That's heat right. go? Yeah. And, you know, your very colleague is working on this problem right now. We're not avoiding it. Um, it's there. It's, it's an issue. We know about it and we're trying to deal with it. We're trying to sort of quantify it, too. I mean, I think th th this issue of being open about, you know, stuff we don't understand and things that don't fit. Uh, I mean, I actually make a point in, in the paper that, that in a funny sort of way, as creationists, we are more dispassionate and could be more objective about our science than an atheistic evolutionist. Uh, which, which sounds crazy. It sounds the opposite of the way it should be. But hang on, you're, you're coming at this from the Bible. But you see, the Bible doesn't give me scientific models. The Bible tells me yeah, there's a global flood. It doesn't tell me mechanisms for that. It doesn't or, or very marginally if it does. Um, you know, there's an awful lot of different possible scientific models that could be consistent with that. So, you know, say as a creationist, I develop my flood model and someone comes along and shows me actually, this is rubbish. This doesn't fit with these bits of it, you know, all, all this stuff. Now, I'd be a bit embarrassed. My pride would be a bit hurt. Um, but my fundamental beliefs would not be shaken because I would still be believing the flood because the Bible teaches it, not because of my brilliant or actually not so brilliant scientific model. What I would know from the science is, well, actually, I need to go away and do some better science. You know, I've, I've done a rubbish model. Let's come up with a better one. But as an atheist, your whole basis for anything actually comes from science and your whole worldview rests on the validity of your scientific model so if if somehow someone shows that actually there's a creator and it wasn't by evolution you're going to resist that with every fiber of your being you're not going to be dispassionate because it undercuts the very uh, basis of your beliefs so in a, in a bizarre irony as, as creationists i think we can be more objective in our science yeah, yeah, I would agree with that, but uh, they probably wouldn't. <laughs> no, no. Well, I'd, I'd like to argue that point sometime with uh, Richard Dawkins or someone, but anyway, we'll yeah. may not happen. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, maybe you could just speak briefly to this point. Uh, you you spend a couple 
couple paragraphs dealing with the idea of is it really science because the biblical worldview is one that posits miracles um is there how do we work through that and, and okay this this is perhaps where there is a slight difference you know i said before that um you know the way i do science is is no different to what i was doing in the lab um you know do science as a creationist is no different to what i did um before in my you know secular scientific career you you do have miracles in the bible but the point is they happen in a physical universe they happen the whole point is they have physical effects you know there's walls of water you know that there's potentially if you are there with measuring apparatus you could you could study that water to wine you could analyze the what was in those jugs before and, and after the wedding and discover that you know it's water before there's wine afterwards nothing else has been you know added or anything else to it if you like there is physical evidence that something as weird as a miracle has happened now maybe there's some other explanation but it's consistent with something as bizarre as a miracle having happened and, and there's physical evidence for that and i think i would argue the same you know with with creation stuff there are sometimes miracles involved i think we need to be very careful about it we can't just invoke miracles ad hoc you know right. where we don't get the right result oh there's a miracle that changed all the numbers <laughs> and um, that's the fear right i think that's yeah. what the fear is but, but again as a you know responsible creationists just don't do that I, I think where the bible tells us there's specifically a miracle you know that's that's the starting point if, if it doesn't give us that specific information i think we need to be very cautious and i think sometimes you need multiple different angles maybe pointing to something like a miracle but, you know, to me, miracles don't undermine science in the same way that belief in the resurrection doesn't undermine history uh, or that belief in miraculous healing undermines medicine. Th that, that, those, that It doesn't need to be like that. Um, you can deal with miracles in a scientific framework uh, just as just as much as anything else. The, the actual miracle itself obviously is is not open to science in terms of its explanation because that's the whole definition of a miracle but in terms of its effects it can be yeah agreed agreed so then uh, building off of that you kind of close this section out this scientific attractiveness out with uh, by asking a question is it is it plausible um i think that this probably yeah. just kind of uh, summarizes some of those other things but you know what's your thinking there yeah, I mean, I mean that. Let's face it, is the thing you get faced with. You know, this is just nuts. Um, you know, this is just so crazy. <laughs> I can't even go there. And I think it's a very deep-seated thing. This this plausibility, isn't it? We instinctively reject lots of ideas. There's loads of things we don't bother to look into because we instinctively know they're stupid or whatever. But that is is actually a very subjective uh, idea. I mean even just at a sort of um, almost political level or, or what is sort of obvious in society, well, that has changed massively over the decades. You know, what, what is seen as economically plausible is very different now to before the 2008 crash, for example. For example, yeah. in, it is in, in, in Britain anyway. You know, morally, um, the idea of, um, you know, gay marriage or something would have been seen as pretty implausible um, you know, in 1950s Britain, um, obviously not the case now. And I think it's a similar sort of thing with some of these other issues. We can, you know, and scientists can think, well, that's just a daft idea. But often some of the greatest discoveries have been when scientists have actually looked again at this and thought, well, hang on a minute. I mean, the, the example I often give on this is um, the uh, that there were some scientists, um, I think from Australia, um, I haven't got the, the information in front of me here, so this is from memory, but um, maybe in the, the 80s that, that, that had the idea that, that some stomach ulcers could be caused by bacteria, uh, not simply through sort of stress or something. And, and they were laughed at by their colleagues who, who said, well, we, you know, the stomach's sterile, you know, there's no, there's no way that, that that can be the case, you know, just laughed at their right. ideas. Well, the right. scientists persisted. They actually drank some of this bacteria that um, they said was a problem and, and gave themselves stomach inflammations and, and whatever and, and to cut a long story short they won the Nobel Prize for medicine some years ago because they were ready to sort of question what everyone knew what everyone thought was obvious so 
we need to be careful about um, you know what what we reject with plausibility. Now, when it comes to sort of creation stuff, people sometimes say, well, it's clearly ridiculous to say that all these rock layers were laid down in a global flood. But hang on a minute. My, my question then is always, well, hang on, how do you know? How many worldwide floods have you seen? What, what's your model for the flood? What are the processes that you think happened? What are the, you know, what was different on day 10 to day 50? And people then sort of stare at you a bit strangely. And, um, you think, well, I don't know, I'm, I'm not investigating that. But that's the whole point. <laughs> right. You actually need a, a sort of detailed model to actually test whether it's plausible or not. You know, how, how can you know that it's implausible for a global flood to do this until you do some sort of work to model what, a glo- what could possibly happen in a global flood? Um, another example, um, I think, you know, I think this again relates to Kurt Wise again, you know, where someone sort of, you know, said to him once, well, it's, it's clearly ridiculous. You know, you've got these dinosaur nests in the middle of these flood rocks. You know, what, what are dinosaurs doing with nests in the middle of a flood? And he sort of stopped and thought for a moment and thought, well, hang on a minute. How much do you know about what dinosaurs do with their nests when there's not a flood? Um, you know, how, how do you know what a dinosaur does in a global flood? You know, how many, and, and you sort of think, well, hang on a minute. Actually, we're making a lot of assumptions here. We don't actually know what, you know, how, how they're going to behave. So my, my point is basically you need to be a creationist or at least you need to have built quite a detailed creationist model to actually test whether it's plausible or not. No, that's a good point. This, this can work. So... Um, yeah, because otherwise you're 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 using little bits of data. Like for example, I, one of the examples I think of is the fact that uh, so arguments are made from creationist geologists about like tight folding and and, and like rocks that are uh, that seem to have been formed um, underwater and things of that nature. And um, uh, there are arguments made from other. Uh, from outside of that that would say, well, uh, it could be that these rocks are the result of, you know, uh, massive superheating or something like that. Yeah. And, and, and my, um, I think I'm tracking right with, with that. And, and so my, my responses to that are, uh, but wait a minute, in a, in a flood, uh, in a flood model, this is a piece of evidence that if if it's even possible that the it could be interpreted this way, then the fact that you could possibly explain it another way doesn't take away from the fact that it could be used in support yeah. of this of this view given the model. And then when you look at the model and you look at the volcanism and all of these things that is as is or volcanism that's involved in that you start to say okay well maybe it is a, a a thing of superheating but maybe it was part of the model of, of creation that we talk about that would in, involve that so you can't all i'm saying is you can't just take the one little piece of data in most cases and, and mm-hmm. try to import it in from another world view or from another set of presuppositions and say oh well this one this one fact yeah falsifies yours that's not how it works you got to have a model and understand how it works within the model i mean i think you can make a good example of that with with genetics actually because where you actually need to make sure you are testing a positive a a, a creationist model because sometimes people say well there's no genetic evidence for you know a, a single adam and eve or whatever um but what they mean is they are processing their different genetic data within an evolutionary um, framework, an evolutionary model, and that is their conclusion. But that's testing the wrong thing. Um, The whole point is a biblical model has um, Adam created as a mature adult for a start. He lives 930 years in the biblical model. How are you going to incorporate that into your genetics? Right. Uh, You know, he has other people living similar ages as a flood that wipes out all humanity apart from one family. Um, You know, the humanity that you need to include isn't just homo sapiens i would argue it's people like homo erectus and other things as well um so let, let's have a, a properly so let's test a properly biblical model but of course the only people that are actually going to start doing that are Christ. are priests <laughs> so this is off, you know i mean the classic one as well is you know there's not enough water to flood the earth you know um i had a a a very eminent geology professor from cambridge challenge me with that once you know his he you heard i was a creationist and um his 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 sort of first knockdown question to sort of 
show how crazy it was to be a creationist was there wasn't enough water for the flood. And I remember I, I looked at him puzzled because I thought, you're an incredibly intelligent person. How can you be that stupid <laughs> to, to, to not to, to in, a, in effect be trying to place the flood within your own geological framework? The whole point of the global flood is that the whole topography of the Earth changed. Right. That, that's an integral part of what it means to believe, um, you know, in the flood. You know, that's that's how and, and he seemed to, that seemed to be news to him when I explained <laughs> that answer, which is, is to me a little worrying. I mean, I think another way just to sort of finish on this point about plausibility is 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 sometimes people think something is implausible because they've got some of the data wrong. And the classic example of this that I give in the paper is um, the, the Coconino sandstone in the Grand Canyon that uh, everyone says is a desert sand. And this goes back to work of an eminent geologist um, years ago um, who, you know, produced this paper saying it's, and everyone's just quoted this ever since. But the work of Paul Garner and others investigated this. And actually, there's lots of lines of evidence that point to this being water deposited, which is quite important because it's found within all these rock layers that creationists are saying were formed in the flood. And the evolutionists are saying, well, why is there a desert layer in the middle of a flood? You right. know? Um, and, and actually... You know, so you think, well, that's a plausibility problem. But in that case, it was based actually on some false data. Um, when you actually look at this stuff properly, there's plenty of evidence that it is water deposited. And I think, I mean, the, the obvious sort of um, elephant in the room, I suppose, is the whole dating issue. You know, I've raised the whole paper on, on this issue of chronology. And we can't go into all of that here and I'm not the, the best expert on this either but I mean the argument I make here is that um, we need to look at all the evidence that there is evidence of a lot of decay of radioactive decay when you look at you know the, the radiometric work but what I think we find is there's a mismatch between that and a lot of other evidence we find in the rocks that is of very rapid deposition without evidence of lots of time gaps and there's a, a there's actually a new uh, booklet that Paul Garner has produced that really um, it's, it's entitled 99% Missing that, that takes you through this argument to say almost that radioactive dating has a plausibility problem, has its own plausibility problem, um, because the dates you get from that just don't fit with what we, you know, the evidence we see in the rocks. And it's not providing the whole answer to, you know, you still got the two things you've got to reconcile, but it's saying, well, actually, there's there's a plausibility problem to these radioactive dates. Uh, and it's almost going to reverse the argument. And that's a new booklet that's uh, that, 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 that's come out um, that you can get from Biblical Creation Trust. Wonderful. Wonderful. So kind of summarizing that whole that whole section, then it's kind of like, you know, again, you actually have to do the work if you're going to uh, object to this. But but let's uh, but let's place that within the framework of scientific attractiveness, right? The attractiveness, yeah. the attractiveness with respect to the paper, chronological creationism. Really, the point is that this provides for us a framework with boundaries and limits and assumptions. It gives us a worldview, really, in which we can, uh, you know, do the work here. We we can actually take and we can build models and we can we yep. can know that some things are true apart from our scientific yep. <laughs> understanding of them. But I think to me, what I always want to communicate is just the excitement of this science. Um, you know, we can do all this new stuff as a scientist. It's you know, very often just, you know, repeating other things. You're doing the same old things. There's nothing actually that dramatic about it. It's crazy. You've, got, you've almost got virgin territory. You can investigate a whole load of things in a different perspective. You can look for new things that no one's ever thought of looking for before. It's it's a really exciting, attractive prospect as a scientist. And and. Again, bizarre, again, it's sort of switching the, the argument around. You're far less restricted than the, um, the sort of atheistic scientists or even the, the sort of theistic evolutionists where you're working within the sort of methodological naturalism. Right. Um, that, that actually constrains the evidence. It constrains the sort of explanations you can give. You, you can sort of open the windows, as it were, let the air in, and um, you, you've got greater freedom as a creationist. Um, it's, it's actually a far more fun and uh, exciting, you know, work to do. And I mean, there's a there's a resource I think we'll we'll put a link to um, 
on a, a, a website uh, to do with the Henry Center in America. It's called Sapienta Forum. And um, there's a couple of articles I've written there that I think if you're sort of getting a bit lost in some of the stuff I'm saying, I'm, I make some similar points in that in quite a brief article. And I mean, it was the article was written to answer this question. Is it really tenable to be a young Earth creationist in the face of the overwhelming scientific evidence that counts against it? So if that's your question to me, <laughs> I, I give my answer in, in that article. It's only, um, you know, 1500 words or something. So you don't have to wade through quite as much as the chronological creationism. And there's and then the sort of moderator then writes a response. And then I write a response to that where I believe it or not, talk a bit about methodology. Um, uh, and it's talking about the, the, the theology and the science. But it's probably almost the briefest compass thing I've written to sort of explain yeah. and justify where I'm coming from. Well, we will absolutely put a, put a link to those. Um, man, thank you so much for your time. This is, uh, yeah, this has really been great. I'd like to kind of wrap up now and, and just get some get some of your final thoughts. Sure your just, listeners uh, would be grateful yeah. for that too. <laughs> Uh, yeah, probably. Well, I may split this up into two parts. I have not decided yet. So uh, if you've listened all the way through, uh, number one, I'm sorry. Number two, thank you. Um, I, I think that uh, I think that. But, yeah. Yes, I would agree. And, and I think that this is a great um, I, I just I hate to limit. I know some people try to keep their keep media within a certain time frame. But uh, when a really good discussion is happening, that hits to the core of an issue. I, mean, I just hate to limit it. So um, uh, thank you, uh, Stephen, for your time and, and helping us to work through this stuff uh this is this is a central issue and it's important um to, to kind of wrap up and give kind of the final thoughts then uh given what we have discussed and we've touched on many different things about about the importance of where the issues really lie and things of that nature what would be first your admonition to kind of fellow young earth creationists uh then what would be your admonition to those who are not young age creationists when it with respect to these issues yeah i mean i think creationists do more theology uh we need to work on the theology um you know i try to to start on some of this but i'm conscious this isn't actually my real expertise there's other people that could be doing you know much more important stuff on this and also you know un understand the science see the the beauty of this sort of model building approach um, we don't need to be, we're not anti-science um, and, and nor are we, nor should we simply be anti-evolutionists. There's something far more positive and exciting to do. And I think I would just stress as well that the, if you like the conclusion of, that I give in this paper, where I sort of talk about a, a you know, a nuanced approach, um, we need to be dogmatic about the right things. And so often it's a sort of a them and us debate. You know, are you are you for this organization? Are you for this prominent creationist or whatever? Um, and that polarizes things in the wrong way. We need to focus on the what are the central doctrinal issues? You know, these what I've tried to define in here, you know, humanity after Adam, death after Adam, global flood after Adam. That's that's that keeps it tightly biblical and and on the things that are central. There's going to be other stuff as well. But let's let's focus on what is what is central. And um, on that, we need to be dogmatic. But too often creationists are actually overly dogmatic on some of the science. You know, they have their own pet scientific model and they sort of almost treat as heretics a creationist that has a different scientific model. Well, I'm sorry, there's different scientific models that can be consistent with what the Bible's saying. Some may be better scientifically than others. That's a perfectly legitimate scientific argument to have, but it's it's not a um, it, it's not a sort of theological heresy argument. You know, the Bible does not tell us uh, what geological layer marks the the end of the flood. Um, so to sort of um, to go too hard on fellow creationists who take a different view on that is 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 a is a wrong thing to do. Have your scientific argument, but it's not an issue of of, of, of doctrine. So hang on, that was, yeah, uh, your other question was about people who are not young age creationists. Um, I would say ask the right questions. Um, ask the question, why did Jesus die? Who is human? Um, for a start, you'll have a more interesting discussion. <laughs> but I think doing that, you will get to the heart of what the issue is. And you'll un at the very least, you'll understand why someone like me um, does spend quite a bit of his time talking about this issue 
in the church. Um, you know, why I wouldn't be doing that if I didn't think this really mattered. Um, and so, you know, at least understand that, that it is not about how long I think the days are. That That is not why I'm um, saying this is such an important issue. So understand that and understand that, you know, on the science side, again, whatever, there's, there's plenty of rubbish out there, just as there's actually plenty of rubbish in secular science. Um, but judge judge it by the best examples. And, um, you know, creation, some of the best creationist scientists, um, you know, they're not necessarily getting everything right. That's not my point. But they do know what they're talking about. Uh, and they are able to critically analyze their work and isn't it isn't it just exciting some of the things that they've discovered even if you think they're wrong isn't it great that they're doing this work for the benefit of everyone yeah man that's that, that's absolutely perfect that's um i i long this is kind of the way that i tell people and I, i've made lots of friends with people who are who don't agree with me on this issue um, i oh. probably probably more more friends with uh, with people who disagree with me here um but but <laughs> honestly I, I get i get more flack because i'm gracious to them um from my own side oh. um but uh i always tell them i long to be understood um most yep. people and even if there's good reason because of some organizations and some of the loud clanging symbols are loud clanging symbols i'm sorry it's just it's just true <laughs> Um, because of that, there are people who don't even give us the time of day. And to those people, I say, you know, I long to be understood. We long to be understood. There is more here than you think there is, as evidenced by your comments. So give us the time of day. Let us explain our case. And like you said, that was probably the best way I've ever heard it put. Ask the right questions. I think that's really helpful. Um, Stephen, where can we find out more about you and the work you're doing? Um, how do we keep up with yeah, that? Yeah, I, mean, I think the, the obvious thing to do is to go to the Biblical Creation Trust website, biblicalcreationtrust.org. Okay. Uh, and you will find all sorts of different resources there. There's various talks. Um, there's articles. It's particularly by myself and Paul Garner, but there's some other people as well associated with, with the work. Um, there's also a set of, of if you haven't had enough of hearing my voice for the last two hours, whatever it's been. Um, you, you've got another 14 hours of it, if you want. On uh, There's a whole series of sermons on Genesis that I did that, that were preached as part of my normal church ministry to a small church in a, a town uh, on the south bank of the Thames, just east of London. Um, congregation of 40 people or so. Okay. Um, of, you know, p people of the whole range of education um backgrounds um you know it's, it's not it's, you know it's not all university students or anything like that so I'm, what i'm trying to say is it was like ordinary normal church ministry and i was if you like trying to expound genesis but but show how if you like the theology there of, of genesis how that ties through the rest of the bible that the god of creation is the same as the god of redemption i don't particularly delve into all the sort of scientific things i i allude to that sometimes um there were actually some children's talks that went with it that you won't find on the website that sometimes tried to address some of that but um but it's if you like trying to emphasize that that with these chapters are talking about reality uh, i think i made the point that um you know we know we know the chronology of noah's life more chrono more precisely than that of christ hmm um, this idea that somehow Genesis 1 to 11 is this sort of shadowy prehistory is just utter nonsense if you actually read the text. Uh, that is not how it's presented. And just trying to really emphasize that, that the historicity of what we're reading and, and the significance of that for us as Christians. So that's, um, I think, something a little bit different to what um, it, it has been done elsewhere. So there's those Genesis sermons available. And I think the other thing... Um, you know, there's, there's other talks and things you, you can find on the website, but those, the articles that we all link to from the, the Sapientia Forum as well. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right, my friend, that was uh, absolutely wonderful. I appreciate you uh, you joining us today and helping us. Uh, again, you, this conversation of ours, I, I'm really thinking about just keeping it together as, as one because this was, again, the first 
kind of conversation in a series of conversations that I'm going to be having with folks who both agree and disagree around this issue. And the very first thing that I wanted was kind of a, a, an emphasis, a great emphasis on what things, what is the core of the issue? Why even spend time talking about it? And I, I think you absolutely nailed it. It's, it's, uh, this is a, a beautiful introduction, I think, to that. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, and I, I'm sorry, just one other thing. I'm just, just conscious that the sort of theological arguments are probably, there's a lot going on there. It might, it's probably a little hard to follow just listening through this. So I would just urge uh, you know, any listeners to get, get hold of the, um, the paper and that hopefully will be set out um, um, you know, more clearly in writing to, to follow all of that. Absolutely. We, we, will, uh, we will certainly link to all of those things that we've talked about so far, and I will make sure that there's a very obvious link to this paper so that they can, they can read it. I would say, if nothing else, uh, reading this paper will shed a lot more light on this, on this conversation. So, Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. your time. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. All right, friends. Well, that was my conversation with Dr. Stephen Lloyd. I sure hope you enjoyed that half as much as I did. Uh, Dr. Lloyd is an intriguing fellow and, man, just so smart and so intelligent. Uh, if you listened with us all the way through the end, I certainly appreciate it. Um, I appreciate his love and his passion for what he does. And uh, I just I, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for listening to this episode of the show. I hope you have a great one. I love you and God bless you.